I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Time to rise and grind. Are you kidding me? Holy on smoke! And let's get this banter going. It's bacon! This is Snowman in the Morning. Does anybody else feel like a fried egg? And it begins now. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I think I just broke my chair. He did what? Has anybody ever told you you have a serious impulse control problem? There is but one cause for me to follow. Almighty the bum! And here we go. Oh, yeah! Good morning, and welcome to this edition of Snowman in the Morning. And yeah, I'm still running around like a crazy man in Durham, North Carolina. My family's here with me, and we're just taking care of a lot of things right now. But, uh, kind of snuck up. No, I didn't sneak away. I'm just kidding. Um, family's here with me. We are doing some things here in Durham, getting some stuff ready. Uh, got a couple of surprises in the works, but I got a couple of great things for you on this show today. Andre Day will join me, William Morgan, to talk XFL in the NBA All-Star Game. You heard a conversation earlier in the week that I had with Jennifer Garrett. You're going to hear that. And Mike DeBate will join me to put a wrap on the 2019-2020 NFL season. But to kick things off, football is not over. And I don't mean just because my friend Mike DeBate and I are going to talk the course of the NFL offseason. A new league launched in the form of the XFL. Yes, it is back. And I don't know what the hell's going on. I kid when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to bring William Morgan back on the hotline with me. What's going on, man? How you guys doing today? Thank you for having me again. Okay. I'll repeat my question with a smile on my face and a very selfish intent to make you laugh. What the hell's going on? Well, <laughs> opening opening <laughs> opening day for opening day for the new season was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um and we had and it was a little bit smoother than it has been today. Um, I have not seen the <clears throat> the game that kicked it off today, but I'm currently watching the game right now, and it's a a tough defensive bout, battle. It looks to be. Yeah. But yesterday we, we had the DC defenders defeat the defeat my Seattle Dragons, thirty one to nineteen. After <laughs> all the issues we had yesterday, oh my goodness! Oh, we had issue after issue. But I'm sticking by my team though. I'm sticking by my team, though. You, you're, you're sticking uh, the, by the uh, you're, so the Seattle Dragons are your team. Yes, that's my team. That's where I'm from, and I'm sticking by my team. Um, then we also had yesterday the Houston Roughnecks behind PJ Walker, who I call PJ the Truth Walker. Mm-hmm. Four touchdowns. They get a big victory against the LA Wildcats, thirty-seven to seventeen. Yep. So great day yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of different rules that's come down into the XFL this year, mm-hmm. and primarily it's geared for all offense. As you can see, if you watched the games yesterday, there were no extra points. You have an equal, nope. you can go literally, <laughs> you can go, if you score a touchdown, you can go for three. If yeah. you're down by nine, you can go for three. <laughs> so you go from the two that's yard awesome. line for one point. Mm-hmm. The five-yard yep. line for two points, and the ten-yard yep. line for three points. So you can literally yeah, make up eighteen points in two possessions. Yep. Okay. You really can. So they kept that. They they kept that part of it. They 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 fixed the kickoffs, and I love that. There's no scramble for the kickoff for for opening possession anymore. They actually do kick it off. Field goals That's are right. still in play. But you need to explain this to me. They Mm -hmm. actually are going to allow a double forward pass. Yep. How? Yep. And that's part. And that's part of keeping the game unique, fresh. But it's also there to make sure it's still geared toward the offense Mm -hmm. in this league as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I I've seen and have been a part of 
backward passes that go to uh, a forward pass. How does this double forward well, pass work? How does it work? How does the double? I've never seen it. I've seen so many quarterbacks run across the line of scrimmage, and I've seen an illegal forward pass. The only time I can honestly say that I've seen a double forward pass is in a scramble situation where you're trying to get the ball downfield, just as Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints against your Seahawks mm-hmm. in, the, in the playoffs. It, is, is, that the, is that the concept? Yes, that's the concept of it. And, okay. and, 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 keep it, and keep in mind, too, if you want it, your formation or your player personnel can be what – player personnel could do whatever – so if you want to take out a tight end and put in another quarterback, you can do that. Really? Wow. Yep. yep. So now you can have two quarterbacks on the field. I've actually seen I've actually seen that happen a couple times. Okay. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to take a look at the uniforms. True or false? <laughs> the Tampa Bay Titans and much respect to them. Have the uh, have the uh, Vipers? Thank you. The Tampa Bay Vipers have the ugliest damn uniforms I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. <laughs> That's what everybody's saying on Facebook. <laughs> I mean, I think the Washington Generals had better uniforms in the USFL than these that I've seen. And I understand them trying to highlight the green. It's a little bit of a USF motif, the University of South Florida motif, but what the hell are those? <laughs> I mean, this is, oh, wait man. a minute. You know, what's, you know what's bad? I showed my wife a picture of that uniform. She handed uh-huh. the phone right back to me and went, I don't want to see that ever again. <laughs> uh. I mean, uh, I, I know they're trying to. I, I, I look. This, these uniforms are better than some of the uniforms I saw last year in the Alliance of American Football. Let's just get that piece of truth out of the way, okay? Yes. But the Tampa Bay Next Vipers, up. you would think <laughs> they would darken the. And I don't want to make this all about the uniforms because, hey. Some of the uniforms I've seen in 2001 left a lot to be desired when the XFL premiered this time. True that. But damn. (laughs) If that's their road uniforms, I'm almost afraid, and I mean this kiddingly, I'm almost afraid to see what the home uniform's like. Oh, man. (laughs) Man. But I I I, I I will say this. These uniforms for the XFL this time around are a lot better than the ones that we saw back in 2001. So are the nicknames, yep. where they put the, where they put the teams, they concentrated on the big markets. I like how the Seattle Dragons motif is. I like that mm-hmm. combination. Oh yeah. Which brings to mind this question and I believe I know your answer. But I want to be sure I put it out there, and I'm going to make this my question of the day a little bit later on in the show. Can the XFL last beyond one season this time? Yes. That's what I thought. <clears throat> I really believe you're looking it at about You're looking at about two to three years with the money that Vince has put into it. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, put a lot of, he's put a lot of money into it. Another thing, too, that I think will make it last two, three years is the fact that Vince is no longer running the day-to-day. Yes. That's going to Commissioner Luck. Yeah. So he's not running the day-to-day of the XFL. Uh, who com- Commissioner Luck is. And I really think this could last. Matter of fact, it may, it may end up being expanded upon mm-hmm. because right now you're looking at eight cities that are major NFL cities, but there's other cities who got left out. Yeah. There's no team in Carolina. There's no team in Georgia. So, you know, we can we can get some of those teams to up this thing to 10. One movie team out in Vegas, there you go. So yeah. we can definitely do some things in the XFL to definitely last beyond this season. And you said the most important thing. Vince McMahon is not a part of the day-to-day operation. He just funded the league. He said he's going to put $500 million bucks toward the league, which will give it three full seasons. And then he hired mm-hmm. a football mind in Oliver Luck 
Most of you should know yep. that name, especially in Indianapolis. Okay? Mm-hmm. Oliver, most people should know the name Oliver Luck. I know I certainly do. He hired a mm-hmm. football. He hired a football mind. When will the Cleveland Browns exactly. ever get this right? He hired a football mind to run the day-to-day operations for this league. Yes. So that's correct. As of this first weekend, it is poised for for success beyond year one. Oh yeah, most definitely. So I believe it would be. I believe it would be a huge success if open today is any type of an indicator. Uh, today is a little bit slow, I guess, a little bit slower. But hey, um, I believe we too will see some more action. But you have two networks that are behind the XFL now instead of just one. Because if you remember, Wait. in two thousand one, it was all on NBC, and then NBC pulled out because they didn't like the ratings. With right. ESPN, and don't forget, and don't, yeah, with ESPN and, don't and Fox Sports, which are two major networks for the NFL, you got mm-hmm. a better outfit this time. I really think you do. And don't, for, don't forget, you got your Fox, you got your ESPN, and you also have your um, your ABC, mm-hmm. um, similar to ESPN, but the same thing. You have three, you you have three major networks versus. 2001, you had NBC and UPN and um, Paramount Networks. Yeah. And NBC wasn't ready at that time um, to really host something like that. That's why they probably pulled out. UPN, you know, wasn't ready. Probably you don't really hear anything from that. I think they got bought out or something like they that. Did. Um, they did. Mm-hmm. UPN so, got you bought know, out. Yeah. So now you have three major networks that are putting time and emphasis on this thing. If you watch any Fox programming, particularly early in the morning, like if you watch First Things First, they will actually push these games on that show. Yeah. So that tells you that they are they are committed to it and want to see it succeed. Yeah. Yeah, and I do too. This is what I opened the show with. I do too. I want to see this succeed now. And I mentioned this at the top of the program. Oliver Luck being in charge is huge. Vince McMahon staying out of the day-to-day operations. And give kudos to Vince McMahon. He learned his lesson. And Mm -hmm. unlike the AAF, he took a full two years to put this together. Yep. Yep. He He took a full two years to put this together. This is William Morgan joining me, talking all things XFL. Stand by, folks. He's going to be back later in the show to talk all things NBA All-Star Game, and I can't wait to bring him back because i got some questions for him. So if you'll hop on later in the show, I'll be glad to have you. Got gotcha, you, man. Stand by, folks. i got more for you after this. This is No Man in the Morning. <laughs> I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. All right, folks. Welcome back and glad to have you with us. I was scouring all around for some great guests to bring on the show. And one of them found me via Twitter. This fellow is a gym rat. He's a baseball rat. And he is a great voice for... He's a great voice in the state of Ohio. He calls games for the Mac for Learfield IMG, and I am pleased to welcome Scoop Miller to the program to talk some college basketball. How are you, my friend? Hey, fantastic, Snowman. How about yourself? I'm doing great. It's a great time of the year. We're speeding toward March. We're speeding toward the NCAAs and, and championship weekend, and you cover a conference I have long loved, especially me being from Chicago, you got the Northern Illinois Huskies, and you being in Ohio, you you got uh, Miami University of Ohio. Let's give the fans a quick look at what Maction is, is like, and there's a reason behind the word. Well, I tell you what, you have to love the Mac here and you're out. You know, it's a mid-major here, as you mentioned. Uh, we have several Ohio schools. You have the Akron Zips, BG Falcons, Kent State. Ohio Bobcats, Miami, 
uh, University of Toledo. Of course, as you mentioned, Northern Illinois there, who I uh, covered a week ago uh, for Learfield IMG. But uh, this is a, a great conference. Uh, this year especially, it is unbelievably wide open. You know, there's no uh, really true favorite as we're just a couple weeks away from the MAC tournament. And speeding toward the MAC tournament, who have you seen so far that could, you know, take over the rest of the way and get one of those number and get one of those top seeds leading into the MAC tournament? Well, I tell you what, I really like uh, the Bowling Green Falcons. Uh, they really came in this year under the radar. Uh, they've had some past struggles, but uh, you know, Coach Michael Huger's done a fantastic job there. Uh, currently, they're sitting in first place, uh, just a half game ahead of the Akron Zips, but they're nine and three, uh, just doing a lot of things well. You know, they've won uh, ten or last twelve games, uh, but they did run into a buzzsaw last night at Akron, lost a tough game to the Zips that really kind of tightened the MAC race up. But uh, you know, they're a team that uh, really plays hard at the defensive end. Uh, they have a, a solid player in Justin Turner who who just can hurt you in a multiple uh, variety of ways. But uh, that's a team I think could make some noise in the MAC tournament, uh, which is held at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse in Cleveland just a couple weeks down the road. Yes, indeed. Looking at the MAC East, Bowling Green, Akron, as you just mentioned, you mentioned Kent State and Buffalo, both at uh, 6-5. and five. And these two are going to, you know, these two are competing for a, what could be a very important spot in that tournament in Cleveland. Yeah, it really is. And the way the MAC does their tournament, you know, there's 12 teams. Everybody gets in, but the top four teams automatically get buys uh, to Cleveland. So you have basically four playing games for seeds 5 through 12. And so you want to be, if you don't get one of those top four seeds, you definitely want one of the next four seeds where you have home advantage on the, basically the playing game to Cleveland. And as we all know, this year in college basketball, uh, the home team has really had a significant advantage this season. And looking at the Mac West, you talk about a home court advantage. Northern Illinois, my Huskies, nine and three at home in the uh, Convocation Center in DeKalb, Illinois. They lost their last one. They are eight and four in conference, half game ahead of Ball State, one uh, two games ahead of Central Michigan, and then you got Western Michigan, Toledo, and Eastern Michigan. Bring it up the rear. How about those Huskies? I tell you what, I really enjoyed covering the Huskies. It was a week ago Tuesday night, and uh, they came in Toledo, were able to get a big road win at Toledo, a place that uh, typically is, is tough to win at, Savage Arena there at UT. But, uh, you know, Northern Illinois, they've won seven of their last ten. You know, they did have a tough loss last night, but uh, I think to Ball State, I believe, in a tight game. But uh, you know, they're very competitive. They have the uh, league's leading scorer in Eugene German, who is a phenomenal player. Uh, he led, in high school, he led the state of Indiana scoring uh, consecutive years his junior and se senior year. Uh, he played at Century 21 Charter School out of Gary, Indiana. Yes, indeed. But, uh, you know, this kid this kid can absolutely fill it. You know, he's got NBA range. Uh, when he hit a step back in traffic uh, over a 6'11 guy for uh, Toledo the other night, uh from probably 28 feet away, uh, really showed me not only about his range, but his confidence, his courage. And the thing is, you try to go out there and defend him, he is so quick with the dribble, he can take it to the rack. He, he's just a tough guard. He's going to get his points regardless. You just really have to uh, kind of contain his teammates, because I'm not sure you can really stop Eugene German the year he's had. I've had a chance to see Eugene German a couple of times, 2014-2015, uh, when they uh, faced Marquette Catholic both times, you know, and Marquette Catholic had a great scorer at the time by the name of Ryan Fazekas. And you talk about Eugene German having a quick first step, unbelievable range, which has just gotten longer since he got to Northern Illinois. You want to talk about a steal of the conference. It is Eugene German. Yeah, I think you're you're right. You know, uh, again, you know, go back to that step back. I mean, he elevated. Uh, it's, I'm not sure his vertical leap is. It's pretty good, but he just elevated, went back, and it was effortlessly. Yeah. But uh, he also can get into your defense. Like that's what really impressed me. A lot of guys will play hard at the offensive end, 
But Eugene was one of those guys that kind of made uh, things happen at the defensive end. They were able to turn Toledo over. I think Toledo had uh, 11 turnovers at halftime, ended mm-hmm. up with 19 that game. But uh, yeah, that was a big part of that uh, Northern Illinois offense from their defense. But uh, certainly, certainly a fun team to watch and, and one of many teams that certainly has to have aspirations of winning that MAC tournament and getting into the NCAA tournament this year. And them having one of the top four seeds, as you mentioned, could be a top two seed if this uh, pans out the way that it pans out. But looking at Northern Illinois and them having one of the top four seeds to get that by is going to be huge when the tournament comes around to Cleveland. Yeah, it really is. You know, when you get to Cleveland, you want to you want to have fresh legs. You want to have that bye game and not have to get that play in to get there. But right now, the way things look, you know, I really I really like uh, Bowling Green. I like Northern Illinois. I like Akron. I like Ball State. I think those are going to be the four teams that are going to slip into those uh, uh, those buys, and uh, the rest of it's really m- pretty much going to be a dogfight. And, and again, I think the MAC teams have won seventy three percent of their home games this season. So you talk about the importance of trying to get a higher seed so you can at least uh, have that home court advantage in that play-in game. Talk about home court advantage. Look at Akron as we go back to the East. 12-2 and at home. Bowling Green 11-1 and at home. I mentioned Northern Illinois 9-3. and But you want to talk about a team that's got a great home court record but hasn't done great on the road and they're going to be in the middle of a dogfight. That is Central Michigan, 6-4 and in the conference. 11-2 Eleven and two at home, but only two and eight away from home. Yeah, that's uh, that's just hard to believe uh, that number right there. And, and that actually one of the losses for Central Michigan was last night. They lost a tough uh, home game to Eastern Michigan by three last night. But uh, you have to you have to be able to somehow find a way to sneak some wins in the road, and that's where uh, the Chippewas have really struggled, as you mentioned, two and eight. Uh, they're currently on a two-game losing streak, but you know, that's a team that's awfully dangerous, too. You know, they have some solid players. But, again, that's what's been so fun about the MAC this year. You know, any given night, you know, if you don't bring your A game, you're going to be in trouble. You know, last night, uh, Miami is a team that's really struggled in the MAC. In fact, they were down at OU on Saturday, 34-11, but they came in three to last night, a tough place to play. And they really dominated the first half, had a nice lead at halftime, but uh, Toledo was able to come back and uh, pull out a victory. But, you know, that's one of those games where I think most people think, well, Toledo's at home, they're going to win against the Miami team that's really struggling. Uh, that's not that's not how it works in the MAC, you know, even though, uh, you know, they've, they've been hurting to get wins there. Uh, Miami, you know, they've lost uh, either last 10, you know, they, they – probably led in that ball game for 30 minutes last night yeah let's take a look at another team in the east uh mentioned kent state six and five now let's look at buffalo six and five 15 to nine overall so they have a chance to reach that war that uh, watermark of 20 wins on the year but it's really going to depend on how they do in the tournament what do you see from them from the uh university of buffalo bulls coming down the stretch well i, I think they're gonna have to really rely on uh Javon Graves, you know, he's he's kind of been their go-to guy all season. You know, that's a team that's uh, kind of fought the injury bug off and on this season, a team that's been banged up. But, uh, you know, if, if you follow the MAC in recent years, you know Buffalo is one of those teams where you typically have to go through if you want to have success in the MAC tournament. So certainly nobody's going to discount uh, the Bulls out you know, right now. You know, they're, they're a team that's won six of their last ten, so they're kind of starting to find their stride a little bit. And, uh, you know, how they finish is going to be huge. You know, they've lost a few more home games this year than I think they're like. I think they're eight and five at home this season. But, uh, you know, that's a team that you certainly can't look past, and a team that's had a lot of success here, uh, especially in the last, uh, you know, 10, 12 years in the MAC. Let's look at the Akron Zips. They're a half game behind Bowling Green. They come in eight and three. Uh, Bowling Green nine and three, Akron eighteen and six overall. They've won their last two. What's kept them afloat? What's kept them in the race for one of the top four? Well, I tell you what. First of all, you know they're a well coached team. Uh, they have one of the top players in the league in Lauren Jackson. You know, uh, right now the Zips they've won nine of the last twelve games, so they're kind of really uh, starting to uh, find their stride there. Uh, they also have uh, a guy named uh, Tyler Cheese. Uh, he's a 
he's a solid player, comes in scoring 16 points a game. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys that uh, can hurt you in multiple ways. But, you know, that's a team where you really have to guard all five guys. It's kind of tough to, to load up on anybody. Uh, you know, so you have to really kind of play them balanced. It's hard to get into them. They handle the ball so well. They can hurt you in transition. Again, that's that's a team that's certainly certainly awfully dangerous. Certainly, uh, you know, they have to believe this could be the year that they get through and not only get to the NCAA tournament, but uh, can maybe have some a little bit of success there on an NCAA tournament run. Scoop Miller joining me to talk some college basketball. We took a look at the Mac, and he's going to pop in a little later. And we're going to take a look at another conference that's near and dear to my heart. We like to call it the Big Ten. He'll stop by later. Right now, we're going to pause for a break. Got some more stuff for you when we come back. This is No Man in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. Welcome back to the program, everybody. Hope you're enjoying it as we're enjoying bringing it to you. You know, I am a fan of podcasts. I record them, I produce them, and I listen to them, a lot of them. And this one got my attention, and you guys know that I've begun to recommend a lot of good podcasts for y'all to listen to. Well, this one not only involves sports, it also involves life. And when I listened to it, I knew, well, when I heard about it, I knew I had to listen to it. I listened to it. I became a subscriber immediately, and I'm going to recommend this even before we get this done. The lady that I have on the line is the author of said podcast, Combining Football and Life. And when you listen to this podcast, you're going to get a lot out of it. And I recommend you not only sign up for it, download it, I I just recommend everything about it. This is Jennifer Garrett, and she joins me right now. How are you doing? Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Okay, you got to tell me how you put this podcast together. What gave you the idea and what what gave you the inspiration to put it together? Sure. So my podcast is called Move the Ball, and that name was taken from a book that I wrote uh, seven years ago. And the book was about how you could take football lessons specifically and apply them off the field to be successful in business and in life. And... After the book was published, I spent the last seven years really working with people on how to move the ball and um, and really grow that brand. And, and I decided that I wanted to do the podcast because it was just another great way to connect with people, having great conversations with professional athletes of all sports, as well as business leaders on how we can use the athlete mentality and put into practice success strategies and habits so that we can get ourselves to the next level. You started the podcast the day after the Super Bowl. You really you really pumped it up. And I have to tell you, I, I really enjoy it. I know I'm going to enjoy it a lot. Um, what got you into football? What got you started in liking football? Great question. So I grew up in Chicago uh, in the 80s. I just fell in love with the game, you know, Ever since I was four, I would watch football games with my parents, and what really intrigued me about the sport was not only the fast-paced nature of the game, but also there were these games where you would have these fourth-quarter comebacks where teams Mm -hmm. were down you know, two, three, four touchdowns, and the game wasn't over until the game clock hit zero. And so I just found that fascinating and studied the sport my entire life and applied lessons from the game into my own life. That is great. So you grew up a ba- you grew up a fan of Dub Bears back in the eighties, huh? Because I too am from Chicago, and I've seen I've seen the Bears over uh, over over many many years. Are there any other teams that you follow aside of the Bears? Uh, professional or college or either? Either one. So I am an Alabama alum. So I very much follow the University of Alabama football. Team, we had a rough, uh, rough season here this past season, but they'll be back next year for sure. <laughs> uh, so I, I could 
have you on the show, and all I have to say is roll tide, and off to the races we go. How about how about a professional aside of the Bears? You follow anyone else? Uh, you know, there's a lot of teams that I like to watch. Um, I think there's some great uh, leaders who are great people, both on and off the field. So it's not just the talent, but it's the character. You know, everyone talks about Tom Brady, right, and how great he was in New England. We'll see where he ends up going. Mm -hmm. um, but I do enjoy watching that team because of the leadership. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like watching the Well, people have hated on my team because my original team in professional uh, football was the 49ers and because of a fellow named Joe Montana, who Tom Brady gets compared to all the time. So I completely understand, you know, the hatred, but I draw the same comparison that people do with Tom Brady and the Patriots, it's because of the way that uh, Montana led his team on the field and the way the organization is run. And a lot of that you can apply to what you do with your what you do with your podcast, which is very motivational, and I absolutely love it. And the lessons that you bring, you know, you can, like you said, you can apply it to life. Yeah. So I think you know I do like watching the Patriots. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great teams. I, I do like Andy Reid. You know, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs Absolutely. for uh, for winning the Super Bowl. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is just a class class act. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed watching the game. You know, the organization. Um, I've, there's some NFC East teams that I like watching. You know, the mm -hmm. Eagles. I like watching the Cowboys. And so, I mean, I, I'm just a, a fan of the game, and I love watching good game so i don't just sit yes. down and watch the bears play <laughs> <laughs> absolutely wonderful talking with jennifer garrett i love a phrase that i happened to catch when i was doing my my research for this interview and i i love how you put this quote you are the quarterback your life is the game own it and move the ball there's your purpose right there for for your podcast who are some of the guests that you've taped episodes with or going to tape episodes with so far sure so the first three episodes were released uh, just this past week the first one was just a solo of me but i had on the show already chris leak chris was the quarterback who led the florida gators to their national championship in mm -hmm. the 2006 season so he was right before tim tebow um tebow was a freshman when chris was a senior taking that team to their championship also I had on uh, Terrence Wood, who is the grandson of Hall of Famer, Pro Football Hall of Famer Willie Wood, mm -hmm. who played for the Packers in the 1960s. Uh, some other guests that I've recorded with already, Paul Pratt. Paul played with the Detroit Lions, and he's got a great organization called Second Wind Men Mentors, where he mentors young boys of single-parent homes currently. So we had a great episode. Another gentleman, Tony Simmons. Tony played on the Patriots. He played on a number of of teams he was nicknamed touchdown tony played at wisconsin mm -hmm. for um college ball some future guests that are coming up as well uh eric dungy who is the son of tony dungy well we're going to be recording an episode here in a couple of weeks um but it's not just football athletes so i've also got a pro skateboarder mikey taylor who i recorded a show with his episode will come out early march um, also Rob Murray. Rob played in the National Hockey League and the American Hockey League for many years. He's currently coaching the Tulsa Oilers, which is a minor league hockey team. So my goal is really a good cross section of athletes from all sports. Absolutely wonderful. Again, this is Jennifer Garrett. You can find her you can find her podcast on anywhere where you listen to. It's called Move the Ball. It's the Move the Ball podcast, and it's absolutely wonderful. Tell everybody where they can find you, my dear. Yeah, so the easiest way, I mean, it, it's going to be on all the platforms, or it is on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. But if you just go to movetheballpodcast.com, you can listen to it directly there, and there are links to all of those other podcasting platforms. Jennifer Garrett joining me here on the program to talk Move the Ball and how she uses football to move the ball in life, and you can do the same thing. Absolutely great having you on. i got to have you on again soon. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate being on the show today. we got more coming up in a smidge.
This is Snowman in the Morning. Holy on smoke! Where true sports talk lives. I like him. He's silly. All right, folks, we continue on with the program, and I want to welcome back to the show a young man I had on a long time ago. Too damn long. He has been tearing it up in the podcast ranks, and I mean that with all the love in the world. I want you all to listen listen for this name as he continues to climb the podcast ranks, the radio show ranks, and I tell you what, I'm so happy to have him back on my show to talk a little hoops with me. He is the host of The Real Deal with Damian Adams, and Damian Adams has joined me. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, man. Like you said, it's been way too long, but I'm super happy to be back on the show with you. Oh, man, I am excited to have you with me. So let's talk. Let's let's talk NBA because it, it's our it's one of our specialties, and you and I are we're, we're, we're playful with each other on the internet when we go back and forth on on social media. But I, first of all, let me get your thoughts on one Kobe Bean Bryant. Man, uh, just a such a tragic, just tragic tragedy. You know, when you think about the fact that we lost nine people way too soon, mm-hmm. and you know, the thoughts go through your mind of, you know, should they have ever gotten on a helicopter? When you think about, you hear about how foggy it was. You know, should they have? You know, we know that it was a way of life for Kobe to take a helicopter because it just made things easier for him. Yeah. When it comes to traffic and just being able to move around with somebody who's that famous, not, you know, being on the streets, everybody and things like that. So we get it that that was something he did normally like we do with our cars every day. Mm-hmm. But you just you just wonder if that's the day they should have changed up the routine because of the weather and could they have changed things? Um, but, you know, you can't go back. And no. so now you just have to take time to not only remember Kobe, but remember Gigi and remember all the victims on this, you know, on that flight. Uh, with Kobe, when you think about Kobe, he definitely made a great impact on the world. Yes, and if there's one silver lining to this tragedy is the fact that you see how many people he affected in such a major way. And, LeBron, and LeBron's speech... Ahead. LeBron's speech this past Friday night. I'm sorry to sorry to interrupt you. The LeBron speech this past Friday night had me crying. Okay, especially when he spoke from the heart. I absolutely adored that. Yeah, definitely. It was the tribute as a whole just was so touching, and it was understandable afterwards how it was kind of a weird feeling because you're watching the game and in the arena you could hear a silence Mm -hmm. like there was some cheering here some cheering there but it was an eerie silence like they don't people didn't know how to react yeah they didn't know you know is it okay to move on now and the thing is it's okay to move on you just you know that you never forget you know we're going to have moments where things are going to remind us of kobe there's going to be moments where someone does something special where only you know, Kobe and Michael or LeBron did it, and we're going to yep. remember Kobe again. So it's, we're never going to forget Kobe Bryant. We're never going to forget Gigi. We're not going to forget those other victims on that flight. And that's what the main thing is, make sure that we keep them in our hearts. And for Kobe, man, when you think of Kobe, for me, I just think of the mom mentality. I think of someone who, as he put it, was a talented overachiever. He had the God-given gifts of being six, 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 seven, with, you know, great athleticism but worked as if he was someone like a Matthew Della Dova. He had mm-hmm. that work ethic if he was somebody who was, you know, scratching and not understanding the league. So that's how I remember Kobe as someone who had the talent of, you know, a Tracy McGrady and Vince Carter and all those guys mm-hmm. who worked as if he was the 12th man on the roster. Yeah, and you could, you see it in all of the legends. You see it in all of the guys that shaped this league and – made this league what it is now the international stars the national stars all coming together all offering their thoughts and their prayers for the bryant family for the other families including the altabella 
Ballet family that lost their life on on that helicopter. And I've said many times on this program, and I know you've heard it, it not only hurts me as a fan, but it particularly hurts me as a parent. Yeah, no, definitely, man. I'm, I don't have kids yet, but the first thing, like, when it happened, the first person who contacted me was my dad, right? And he, you know, just wanted to say I love you, you know, because you never know when those moments will be lost to be able to say I love you to the next person. You know, we've all lost somebody close to us in not such horrific way as this, yeah. but we've all experienced some type of loss. And this just puts it into perspective how – Life as it's the longest thing you'll do, but it's yeah. also something that can have that can end very quickly. So we just have to take every moment and cherish it. Yeah, yeah. I, I say I love you to my wife and my children all the time. Um, you know the story of uh, my baby girl Donna. I lost her when she was two. Uh, 2015, I lost my dad in 2007. So yeah, I, from both ways, it affected me as a fan, as a parent, and as a son. And as you said best, my friend, you have to you have to live your life to the fullest. That's what Kobe did. That's what I'm trying to do. I know that's what you're trying to do, and a and a fabulous show in the in, in the process of, of 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 doing it. Let's talk some NBA, man. They made some changes to the All Star game in terms of the scoring, and I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at the changes, but I have. And considering it's in my hometown of Chicago, the All-Star Game is, and I know they're doing this to honor Kobe. I know they're doing this to honor Kobe, and rightfully so. But i got to be honest with you, man. I took a look at the rules, and I went, what the hell are these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a chance to look at the rules. Um, I actually yeah, I posted it in the group, the Real Deal with Damian Adams group Yes, from the three-point conversion. They posted the rules. And I, I shared it from their page. And, yeah, I had the same reaction you did. I was looking over and I was trying to understand <laughs> exactly <laughs> what, you, you, you know, know, exactly the what on, they were hey, trying to do. You and I have talked sports a long time. You know that look on yeah. my face. I saw the room and I looked at that link that you that you posted. And, folks, check out the three-point conversion as well. Another fabulous group of ju- uh, sports journalists. What the hell are these rules, man? What the hell are they trying yeah. to do? <laughs> yeah, I. the only thing I can say that they're trying to do is maybe this is their way of trying to amp up the competition through all four quarters. Because yeah. we know normally with the All-Star game, what you get is you'll get the first two quarters and a half where they're just kind of jogging back and forth. You'll get yep. some alley-oops. Mm-hmm. You'll get some long-distance threes. And then the competition doesn't really – go up into the fourth quarter right. if it's close. If, and that's when if, you'll start to get big, real competition. And that's a big if. It hasn't been close for a yeah. while, but that's a big if. So with these rules, what they're trying to say is, okay, we're going to have each quarter count as a win or a loss, and maybe that will wrap up the competition. But to me, if you want to honor Kobe, it's up to the players. Yeah. Right? Like, you can do all the things from an outside perspective, like them wearing 24 and wearing two to honor Kobe and Gigi. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. But if they want to honor Kobe as far as the play on the court itself, they have to just go out and leave it all on the floor. There's a reason Kobe had four all-star MVPs is because he went out there and really played. So those guys, exactly. like, there's certain players who do play, like Giannis. Mm-hmm. Like, some people say Giannis plays too hard in the all-star game. <laughs> That's something that Kobe would love. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, him, LeBron plays hard. Those guys yep. are going to bring it, and I think that's the normal way you should honor him. Kobe, MJ, LeBron, Julia serving back in the day for me when I got started watching Magic Johnson. You yeah. want to honor Kobe? Play that way. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with that. Like, if they just went out there and said, okay, we're going to play for real, <laughs> you're, that's the thing. You're still going to get – you're still going to get the highlights because of the best yes. players in the world. So you're going to have moments where you get a steal, mm-hmm. you get a fast break, and you'll still get to have those moments where you throw the ball at the backboard and some crazy athlete gets to come and tear it down. And, you'll and, still have those highlights. Yep. And it would be even better if we know that came off of a real play. Yeah, if it came within the flow of the offense, if it came, like you said, off of a real play. Let me ask you this, and 
I, I've talked so many times on this program about ratings being down for the NBA. And my theory is this, and I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but I want you to think about this, and I want your thoughts. Does the NBA and its ratings miss the Splash Brothers? They definitely miss the Splash Brothers. They miss Steph Clay. Mm -hmm. You miss Zion for a huge portion of the year. Mm -hmm. So those injuries in themselves really cost, right? Yeah. Then LeBron being on the West Coast, hurts you because yeah. like his games come on late in the East Coast right. where people are asleep already. Mm -hmm. so you combine the fact that the Warriors who have been your biggest draw for the past five years are yep. no longer a draw at all. LeBron being on the West Coast, mm -hmm. the rookie Phenom who was supposed to, you know, have New Orleans on the map was missing for the, most of the first half of the season. That's really going to hurt your ratings. Right. Yeah. So now that Zion's back, uh, Steph will be back. They say maybe six weeks to be reevaluated, but the Warriors, I think they're pretty much lost for this year. Mm -hmm. So when you have Zion coming back in the playoffs starting where you have games coming on every night and a little earlier, I think that's when you'll start to see those ratings get back up. Yeah. And plus football season officially ended yesterday. Yep. I think the NBA will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. I think so too. It was just so many, uh, factors that came in at, at, at the top of the season. Talking with Damian Adams of The Real Deal with Damian Adams on all things NBA. Man, uh, it's so much to, to, to un unpack right now. I haven't had you on in a long time. I had one of our mutual friends on, Courtney Harden, a few years ago to talk all things NBA All-Star Game, and we bust out the old school All-Star Game talk and how it was, and how, how it was competitive. And I was on um, his show recently. And we talked the uh, we talked the same thing. Is the NBA missing that competitiveness now than it was back in the say the eighties and the nineties? I wouldn't say it's missing it per regular season games and postseason games. The All Star Game definitely like it's not you're not going to see that competitiveness, <laughs> but I do think that. The players themselves are just as competitive as they were back then. Yeah. The game has changed. True. So now that competitiveness just comes out in a different way. So in the 90s, when people were competitive and you saw people get frustrated with Jordan, that's when you saw Bill Lambert come <laughs> and hit Jordan. Those, yeah. <laughs> those things right. aren't going to happen You're now. Right. <laughs> yeah. that's, when you, <laughs> so. that's when you saw the rise of the bad boys. And on top of that, that's when you saw the Bulls answer them. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, it was a different way to, you know, channel your competitiveness back then than mm -hmm. it is now. But now you have it to where it's so much more free flowing. I believe mm -hmm. the game today is more attractive than it was then. Yeah. When you think about the way that the, the game is so spread out and how you get so many great plays and you get to see these athletes on offense do what they do. And defensively, I believe it's harder to play today than it was back then because yeah. you're not allowed to touch up the players like you were back then. There's no hand checking. People forget about hand checking. Like right. that, it makes your job so much easier when you can just have your hand on the player, holding them pretty much as they're trying to make their move mm -hmm. as you guard them. No hand so now checking. you have to move your feet. No yeah, arm you have to bars. Move your feet. You know, no arm bars. You can't do that either. <laughs> exactly. We, we, don't All get, that's gone. Don't get me started um, on screens. Don't get me started on fundamental screens, man. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a big thing. That's one of the things that I used to hate watching the Warriors as they're going through their success. You know, you see Draymond Green get away with illegal screens all day. <laughs> but <it's something laughs> uh, Draymond Green in modern times was Bill Lambert and James Edwards back in the eighties and nineties. All right, <laughs> for the Bad Boy Pistons. Let's yeah. just be. Let's just be. That's real. one thing I'll, I'll say about Draymond. Draymond's one of those players that was built for back then. Like yes. if he was playing back then, he'll yes. fit right in. Absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> so it's <laughs> something that like the style has changed, mm -hmm. but I think the competitiveness of the players is still there. They're just smarter about the way they go about it. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of the load management, but I get it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a player who may have a sore knee or tendonitis, like a Kawhi Leonard, mm -hmm. you may be smarter to manage it, you know, but some players are just built different. Like LeBron, LeBron could play in any era, right? Yes. Because the way he's, he's built, he could, you know, plow through anybody. He could plow through the eighties, <laughs> <the> you know, <laughs> you know, cause he's built 
sport at. So mm-hmm. I think we should appreciate the 80s and 90s for what it was, and we still could appreciate today for the wide open spread game that we have and the entertainment we get today. I'll give you a couple of dream matchups I would love to have seen across eras. Um, start with the guard position. Wouldn't you love to see a couple of games when AI would go up against Stephen Curry? Oh, it would be amazing. <laughs> Neither one of them could stop each other. <laughs> but it would be, it'd be amazing to watch. It would, yeah, it, it, would be, it would be so amazing. Yeah. The dribbling sensation yeah. of AI, the dribbling of Stephen Curry. Clear the floor and let them go at it, man. Yeah, exactly. And we only got a taste of it. We got very young stuff against older AI. Mm-hmm. So we didn't get to see them in their prime against each other. I wish we could have got to see that. Because yeah. you think about AI and him being so dominant in the mid-range and being able to drive to the goal at his size, you know, being maybe the best pound-for-pound player of all time. Mm-hmm. Then with Steph, no matter what era you play in, you can't stop a guy who's shooting from <laughs> six feet behind the line. Like, it doesn't matter <laughs> what era you're in. <laughs> You, how, how rough you try to be, if he's pulling up from six feet behind the line, it doesn't matter. It really so I don't think either they, <laughs> yeah, they couldn't stop each other. I mean, how many times I, I, I have, I, I get the Warriors network, you know, they're on KNBR or, or 95.7 of the game, I beg your pardon. How many times have we heard Tim Roy or Bob Fitzgerald on NBC Sports Bay Area go, he's shooting from the logo? And you're thinking, <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. Steph, you know, Dame has become logo oh, Lillard. Man, so, <laughs> Damian has really yeah, so, grown. I love watching Damian Lillard play. Love watching him. Yeah, play. no, he's amazing. I mean, yeah, we, he's amazing. We got Damian and Steph last year in the West Finals. I just wish it had gone longer than four games. But when you're playing the two-time Warriors, and they weren't even at full strength, so that tells you a how far Portland has advanced, and b how tough the Warriors were. I'll give you a dream matchup. How about a, a three, an ultimate three-point contest? Let's do this. An ultimate three-point contest. You got to have Ray Allen. You got to have Steph. You got to have Clay. You got to throw Larry Bird in the picture. Definitely. You got to throw Reggie Miller in the picture. Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you definitely got to have those five. Mm-hmm. Um, if you throw in a sixth for ultimate three-point contest. Mm. Who who would be think that? About, like, there's so many great shooters. Yeah, there is. Um, yeah, there is. Who would yeah, be that? Six, so many great. Who would be that? I'm thinking person? Glenn Wright. Yeah, yeah, that's six. We gotta have eight. Yeah, we gotta have eight. We got so, Steph. We got so we got Steph. We got Clay, Bird, um, Reggie Miller, Glenn Rice, Ray Allen. Yeah, we got six, and you gotta have seven. We gotta uh, have seven and eight. We gotta have seven today because so, so back our, in the day you had you yeah. had eight competitors. Yeah, no, definitely. So if you're gonna go old school with eight competitors for Craig Hodges, yeah, throw him in there, Craig Hodges. And you know what? Because yes, he I know was who, amazing. I know who the eighth person is, Steve Kerr. Yeah, now Steve Kerr is definitely. <laughs> I think he still holds the record for his most accurate. Yeah, three point shooter of all time. Yeah, so gotta have Kerr. him in there as well. Gotta, gotta have Steve Kerr. Now, how about uh, how about the ultimate slam dunk contest? Uh, well, you got to have Vince Carter. You, you got to. You got to have Vince Sanity. Got to have MJ. Yeah. Got to MJ. Kobe. Dominique yeah. Wilkins. Dominique Wilkins. Kobe gets a vote. Yeah, I would throw, yeah, I'll get throw Kobe in there as well. Kobe gets a vote. Um, I would go a little new school and take um, Zach Levine. Yeah. Zach, Zach Levine's there nasty. Zach Levine. Yeah. You want to you want to stay new school? Here's another new schooler I'd add. Um, you'd have to be a few years back. Andre Iguodala. Andre Iguodala was nasty. He's his he was good <laughs> in the contest. He was pretty good. Andre yeah, Iguodala. he's somebody who gets forgotten about because of Nate Robinson. But yeah, right. Andre Iguodala was nasty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, he was nasty in the contest. Yeah. Someone else who was nasty. He's not so new school anymore. He retired a few years ago. But Jason Richardson. Mm-hmm. Jason Richardson. Very good in the dunk contest. Um, um, Julius Irving. Yeah, his battles with Justin Nixon were great. Julius Irving. Um, oh yeah, you gotta, gotta have, have Dr. Doc, J. He's the gotta have Dr. J. Yeah, and the one who won yeah. it in '84 to start the new trend, Larry Nance. He was the first to have a two-ball dunk. Mm. You gotta have Larry Nance. Yeah. 
Yeah, now Larry Nance <laughs> definitely is, is at that system at that size, which is crazy. We're going to be doing those things. Man. And at that time, too, yeah, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, it was that was crazy. But like I said, we got to have Dr. J in there because he dunked from the foul line in 1976, and then Jordan did it in 85 in Indianapolis. Yeah. Okay. Now the two-ball competition involving the best pairs and – you know where I'm going to start. You know where I'm going to start first. I got to go to my hometown and get MJ and Scotty to start with. Yeah, got to have got yeah, to MJ have Scotty. Got to have MJ and Scotty. Yeah, definitely. Um, Shaq and Kobe. Shaq and Kobe. Got to have um, um, one that doesn't have any championships, but definitely should be up there is Gary Payton, Sean Kemp. Yeah. Oh, I got a pair for was, you. That alley oop combo was great. Yes, I got a pair for you. KJ and Charles Barkley. It's yes, Kevin Johnson might be the most underrated player of all time. Thank you. Um, he, Thank you. <laughs> he's, he was spoken amazing. About K, we've spoken about KJ, and I posted online yeah. that KJ is one of the most underrated point guards to ever play, which gives me this. Definitely. If we expand our ultimate three-point competition to ten players, I got number nine for you right now, and that's Mark Price from back in the oh. day with the Cleveland Cavaliers. How about that? <laughs> yeah, Mark Price. Mark Price was yeah. Mark Price was great, man. He's somebody who a lot of people sleep on him, but like mm-hmm. the, when you see people split up pick and roll today, like that started with Mark Price. When that was start, pick and it roll. started with Mark Price. It absolutely started yeah. with Mark Price. So you got MJ, yeah. you got no, MJ and Scotty, Shaq and Kobe. Yeah, Gary and Sean Gary Kemp. And Sean Kemp. Uh, KJ you and Charles. Stockton Malone. Stockton Malone. Gotta have Stockton Malone. Yeah, because that's. That's the greatest duel to not win. Like you got, you got to give them that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you think about one is second all time in points, the other one is first all time in steals mm-hmm. and assists. Yep. And that. Which leads to this magic with anybody: James Worthy, Kareem, <laughs> Byron Scott. Yeah, that's the thing. You could pick the Lakers team. That team, you could pick. A bunch of different duos. You can pick anybody for that team. Just, <laughs> yeah, you just a magic there, and you could just put anybody else there. Like yep. that, those those Showtime Lakers are amazing. Like Magic Kareem, you definitely have to put up there though, as this, far as duos. This one's for my this one's for my wife. About a couple of Indiana Pacers, Mark Jackson and Reggie Miller. That's a good duo. That's really good. You got to put uh, that I think an underrated one for the 2000 Finals was Jalen Rose and Reggie Miller. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, those guys, because they were they were one of the few duos ever to both score forty points in the game. Yep. People sleep on Jalen Rose and they think of him just as the analyst or the one who got dropped eighty one on by Kobe, but he was he had a pretty good career. He People did. sleep on that. He did. He absolutely yeah. did. He absolutely did. Um, speak. Here you go. Speaking of the Knicks, Charles Oakley and Patrick Ewing. Yeah. No, nah, definitely. That's, a, that's probably the most physical duo that's going to be mm-hmm. there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Or. Here's a physical. Uh, here's a physical duel: Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. Since we're talking about duels, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a nasty one. You got the inside out game. Yep. You got the man of a thousand post moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin McHale. Kevin McHale. Speak of underrated players. Kevin McHale has to be up there as well. Yes. Just because of time, people have forgotten how good he was, and mm-hmm. plus he was under the shadow of Larry Bird yep. and Robert Parrish. Like he's one of those guys. Like he could just go in the post and do work. You want under- the most athletic. You want underrated. But he just does work. I posted. I posted this, and you agreed with this name. Speaking of underrated, James Worthy. Yeah, yeah, he gets lost because of Magic and Kareem. Mm-hmm. He's somebody who was definitely an awesome player in his day. So you definitely have to give him respect in that way. Absolutely. You gotta have. How about? Tim Duncan and David Robinson. There's a pair. Yeah, no, that definitely was a uh, that's a great duo. If you got Tim Duncan, you also have to put Tim Duncan, Tony Parker in there. Mm-hmm. Pick and roll with Parker and Duncan, or or Duncan yeah, and Parker, as, as as was the case many times. Let's stay in Texas. Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, that team definitely should have won some championships. When he was younger, of course, the king got his two when he got older. But mm-hmm. when he was with Ralph Sampson, they definitely should have got one. How about a current duo, or, or a duo that I wish was current? Luka Doncic and Dirk Nowitzki. Speaking of Mavericks, 
Oh man. Yeah, if you, yeah, we could somehow, we could somehow put them in the, put Dirk in the time machine. That would be, that would be awesome. Yep. I think Dirk and, uh, I mean, not Dirk, but I think Luca and Porzingis will be a great duo soon. Yes. I think those two yes. will work together and become great. Mm-hmm. Um, we got Stephen Clay. Got to put Stephen Clay in there. Gotta, gotta have the Splash Brothers. Yeah. You have to, gotta put those two in there. You just have to wonder what records they would set. How about, um, let me go back to my hometown. Uh, Derek Rose and Luol Dang, and how how good they were. That's work. a good one. Yeah, if, if Derek Rose could have stayed healthy longer, I know. that team could have been. Uh, that team definitely could have won championship with the defense they had. The only running thing, offense with Derek Rose. And I said the only thing that stopped the Bulls in the Thibodeau era from winning titles was injuries, because they were beat up by the time 2013 got here. And I hated yeah. that. I hated that they were that they they were that worn out and they were that beat up. So we got to throw them in there. Rose and Lou all dang, um, Kobe and Paul Gasol. Yeah, that's a good duo. That's a good duo. People forget how good Paul Gasol was in the mm-hmm. prime. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a he's arguably a top ten power forward all time, and you know people because Kobe was so great, people sleep on that. But Paul Gasol, yeah, in his prime, man, he was really good. Oh, how about this duo, Mike Bibby and Chris Webber? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a team that <laughs> probably should have won a championship. 2002, that 2002 Sacramento Kings team is up there. When you talk about the greatest teams to not win, Kings. That 2002 and Sacramento Kings team is definitely right there. Yeah, yeah, one of the most epic Western Conference Finals we've ever seen. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Damian Lillard. Um, you got to put LeBron and, and Kobe. You got to have LeBron and Kobe. I mean, not LeBron and Kobe, but LeBron and Dwayne Wade. I mean, there you go. You got to put LeBron and Dwayne Wade. LeBron and Flash. Um. um I, I just spoke their I just spoke their names. I just spoke their oh, names. Talking about Damian, Damian, Damian and Lillard, CJ. Thank you, Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. Or if you want to go back in the day for the Portland Trail Blazers, Clyde Drexler and Terry Porter. That's a very good one. That's one that probably gets forgotten in history. That's a very good one. It's a forgot. It's a forgotten duo. The Portland yeah. Trail Blazers in 1990 they had a they were a forgotten West champion because everybody had their eyes on Phoenix after they upset the Lakers. And, and took them out of the playoffs. Yeah, definitely. No, that that Portland team should have got one. They should have yeah. got a championship in there. They, they should have got one. They should have got. Here you go, Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. If you want to stay modern, that's a that's a that's a duo that's gonna be good for the years to come. <laughs> think, think about Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell is what twenty three, what twenty four, and Gobert yeah. is like twenty seven. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you got a you got a team. That's a pretty good duel for years to come. Yeah, it is. It is. Damian Adams of the Real Deal with Damian Adams. Tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Oh man, thank you again for having me on the show. I really do appreciate it. Um, you can find me everywhere on social media at the Real Deal W D A. So that's the Real Deal W as in whiskey, D as in Delta, A as in Alpha. The show, the Real Deal with Damian Adams. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. So if you listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Castbox, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find the real deal with Damian Adams. It's real sports talk for real sports fans. So I know if you listen to this show, you're a real sports fan and you will enjoy my show as well. I truly appreciate those words, my man. Please subscribe to the real deal with Damian Adams. I'm a subscriber. I recommend it. his podcast. I recommend his show he just recommended mine man thank you so much for coming on i gotta have you on again more often we gotta do this again definitely i gotta have you on my show as well we gotta make this connection happen more often thank you again sir you got it my friend thank you very much this is no man in the morning I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. So I had the pleasure recently of being on a wonderful show called Black in Business. And I figured with this being Black History Month, I'm going to return the favor On the hotline with me is one of the fellows who's in charge of said podcast. This is Andre Day, and he joins me right now. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic, my brother. How are you? I am doing great. First of all, let me say thank you 
from the bottom of my heart for um, letting me come on to your podcast and spreading some knowledge and spreading some love for the other podcasters, the other independent show hosts that that do this just just like we do. I can't thank you enough for that. Man, listen, I tell you, I can't thank you enough for being on the show because you you gave more than what I even thought was going to be given. Like, I thought it was going to be like, you know, regular run of the mill. And then we end by spreading love and showing love to brothers and almost putting us to tears, man. So I thank you a whole bunch for that. Thank you for being on the show. That was one of the things I really wanted to touch on. And it's something... You know, my wife tells me all the time, she says, maybe that can be part of your message as well as you having fun doing your sports show. Maybe you can drive that point home. And this is the point that I've driven home, you know, for the time that she and I have been together and for a while now. There is not enough help out there in many ways for men. Let's take color out of the equation. There's not enough help out there for men who need to get back on their feet, who desire to get back on their feet, and for those who want to stay on their feet. That's why I love talking about that particular message, and I'm glad you helped me spread that message when I was on your your show. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, One of the things, um, and also one of the reasons that, caused me to start the show was I wanted to spread a message not only for African Americans but also just for the wider generation in general Um, a lot of individuals my age both male and female I don't believe they have the same drive that people before had Um, and then also with that a lot of people don't get like you said enough um, assistance to start um, and I believe it starts from like when we grow up where we're taught certain things and then just kind of let go and then just uh, like, oh you're an adult you can do it but you get a totally different um, uh, let me see you get like a totally different viewpoint of what adulthood is and then when you kind of reach back out for help there's nobody there to help you so I mean, spreading love and, and showing love to men is something that we need to do every day. Like every moment of every day you have, say I love you to a man. It'll help out a whole lot. And this is what a lot of men don't get. Well, a lot of men get it, but they don't voice it aloud. And I was guilty of, mm-hmm. of such. Um, mm-hmm. I said I love you to my dad and my granddad and my uncles every day that they were here. You know, they've all passed on now. But I don't mind one bit saying I love you to a man who is very close to me. There are some broadcasters who I say it to, and I say it live on this show. I don't mm-hmm. think it's not. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. In fact, it's a wonderful thing to communicate that for men to communicate that to each other without having this two PC world misconstrue why we're saying that to each other. It needs to be said a lot more often. Yeah. And I think also it needs to be said in um, in a way where when you say it, you say it with confidence. I feel like if I say it to you, I'm only going to say it when it's only you and I. Like, you know, certain people don't want other people to know that I said I love you. But it shouldn't be that way. Just as well as it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you show affection and love to your wife. People don't want to see that, but you don't care because it's between you and your wife. So I think the same thing should be from man to a man. Like, if I love you, I don't have a problem with giving you a hug, showing you affection, saying I love you, say I appreciate you, um, taking care of you, things of that nature. And it really doesn't matter what other people say or how they look at me or what they may think because it's not for them to, like, it's not for them. It's for me and you. So as long as you and I have the understanding, I can honestly care less about what other people think. And that's what, really where I think a lot of people don't show it is because they believe or think, oh, I don't want this person to think differently of me or what this person might say. And it really is affecting you more than what you may know. It really is. It really does affect the person that, you know, thinks aloud 
and thinks constantly about what other people think. I've had to learn from other people, my wife included, and uh, my daughter and my son included. You know, you can't think about what people say or think about you. That's just going to affect you. Do I have my days mm-hmm. where I slip back into that? Absolutely. And I say that I, I say that aloud, and I say that with conviction because i'm still learning a lot from my wife and her family and i'm learning a lot about myself at the same time being on your show where i was allowed to express what i felt and not just in the sports world but just in life Mm -hmm. that that meant a lot to me i can't thank you and your partner enough for allowing that to happen and allowing that message to be spread that needs to be that needs to be spread more often so if men can communicate like that, do you know how different this country, let alone this world, will be? I think people are afraid of what might happen. Um, when I grew up, I saw a lot of um, things in person and a lot of things that are on TV that don't really show men loving each other. So adults now that are my age bracket, you know, late twenties, early to mid thirties, don't have that I love you type of mentality. So what happens in turn is that you have an issue, you deal with it by yourself, and then when you don't know how to get the results you need to make a better outcome for yourself, you start lashing out and doing things that you normally wouldn't do. So to answer your question, if we express love to one one another more often, I think we would have, number one, happier individuals. And number two, we would be able to think more clearly and start doing things that would help us with a better life instead of putting us where we are in that mentality of crabs in a a barrel trying to keep everybody down. We would want to see everybody move up. So I think it would have an effect that I don't think um, the world is ready for on the African-American side. Like if we really put our minds together and stick to one another, I think we can be, actually I know we can be a force to be reckoned with. Where did you grow up? Let's find out more about Andre. Where did you grow up? Well, my, um, I grew up in um, New York. I'm originally from Brooklyn. Both my parents are uh, from New York. Um, I lived in New York for about seven or eight years or so, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, and then I moved to New Jersey for about a year or two. And, um, after New Jersey, I moved to Maryland. Um, and I've been here in the Maryland DC area since, uh, let's say ninth grade or so. Wow. That's the 10th grade. Yeah. Wow. So you're you're originally from New York. I can I can hear that accent come out. Where, <laughs> where's your Where's your sports loyalties lie? Which teams get you at the heart? Well, I am a football fan, so my first team at heart would be the Giants. Um, Good man. I also like <laughs> I also like to see. The Jets every once in a while, just because they're also New York. Um, I I don't really watch a lot of baseball, but um, it it does feel nice and feel good to see the Yankees do something well. Mm-hmm. Um, and other than that, I you know I would say basketball. I was into the Celtics, but after they dismantled the uh, Kevin Garnett and the uh, Paul Pierce. And Ray Allen, I kind of spread away from the Celtics. Right now, I'm just kind of open. I like kind of any basketball team as long as it's a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really watch a lot of hockey, but people tell me I need to get into it because it's a really good and interesting sport. Um, and that's really about it for sports. Now, I'm going to tease you because I do have love for the New York football giants. I loved it back in the day when Bill Parcells and Bill Walsh would hook up and go at it, be it mm-hmm. at be it at the old Giant Stadium or at Old Candlestick Park. Um, you're not a you're not into basketball that much. 
not like I used to. No. Um, I, like I said, I used to. I, I used to be a Celtics fan, but once they dismantled that that amazing team, I just kind of. I don't know. I went away. Good. Then I can say Michael Jordan and get away with it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. My head, listen. <laughs> Even though you don't watch basketball, you know who Michael Jordan is. Yes. Like, thank you. Thank he was you. he was on the Wheaties box. He was on every magazine. I mean, he was all over walk the in place. Any country, yeah, you walk into any country and say MJ. There's only one person that. I mean, they might do Michael Jackson, but only those two have MJ. There's no other right. MJs that are prominent in everybody's mind. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're fine so with true. Jordan. So, so yeah. true. And I've, I've spoken to a couple of hardcore Knicks fans, and I kid them a lot. And I said, well, I guess I can't say Michael Jordan. And they start growling at me, but then we, we all start <laughs> laughing, laughing at it. But I love having conversations like this during the show that, you know, gives people the other side of the shows and the podcasts that I do. So that's why I wanted mm-hmm. to I wanted to bring you on and you got to tell me how you got how did you get your podcast started? Well, in um a previous job I had, I was just kind of sitting in the office and um it was a Friday afternoon I believe. And I'm just sitting there pondering like, you know, what else can I do besides work? every day, same job, Monday through Friday, and sometimes on Saturday, and just go home. Like, there has to be something else I can do. So I started just thinking, like, you know, I'm not really putting my business degree into play because this job that I had at that time, really anybody can do. Um, And I really wasn't doing much of a, like, a side hustle, per se. So my uh, supervisor at the time walk through the door and as soon as he walked through the door a light bulb came into my head and i was like "Ooh, i can do something that promotes small businesses but how can i do it so you know i, I, I sleep on it i think about it for a couple of days and i go well i can do a podcast well how do i do one i did my research and once i found out that you can literally start a podcast for free it was a no-brainer after that. All the thing I needed was people to have on the show. Um, as long as you have an email address and a place to host your podcast, it's essentially free. You don't have to buy anything. Um, you can do it from your phone. You can do it from your laptop. I think the only thing that you may need to buy if you want to get fancy is a microphone. Yeah. But everything else is essentially free. Um so once I got that idea, I just started reaching out to people and letting them know, like, hey, I want to start a podcast and, you know, uh, promote small business owners and kind of discuss with them how they started and, um, you know, what they do to keep themselves going and things of that nature. And, um, you know, I got a few people to say, hey, yeah, no problem. I'll be in your show. And I was kind of taken back, like, oh, really? You want to be in my show? So, OK, uh, OK. Like, I was kind of nervous at that point. But then I, I said, this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I did it. So it just kind of went from there. Well, I am very proud of you. I am very proud to have uh, been a guest on your podcast. You and I share a mutual friend, Stephen Askins of the Inside mm-hmm. uh, Foot, uh, Inside Football Blitz. He was on your program, and he was the reason he was the guy that led me to you and led me to your podcast. So I am very, very proud to be a guest on your podcast. I'm proud to have you on on this show. And tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Oh, so they can find me. I would say the easiest way is to, um, you can email us at um, blackandbusinesspodcast at gmail.com. They can find us on Facebook, which is Black in Business Podcast. It can also be found on Instagram, which is black underscore in business. And um, we're located at... Um, you know, on Apple, iTunes, Google iTunes, I mean, Google uh, Podcasts, we're on, um, what is that other one, uh, Spotify, and I believe those are the three major ones. I mean, we're on some other smaller ones I can't think of right now, but those are the, the three major ones at this point. Hey, folks, check out the Black in Business podcast. I was a guest on it. If you know someone that has a small business, and this is Black History Month, if you know someone that has a small business and they want to get featured, 
This is the guy you contact. This is the podcast that you're on, and you get featured on this show as well. Andre Day, one half of the Black and Business podcast, joining me here on the program. I can't thank you enough, and I recommend to the folks again, I recommend to the community, please go check out the Black and Business podcast. Thank you for your time, my friend. I can't wait to have you back on. I appreciate it. And before I go, I just want to give a shout out to my co-host, uh, Bearded Wonder. Um, he's it, once you guys listen to the show, you'll see why he's such an awesome person. And um, I'm glad to have him as a co-host. And I can't wait to just continue to bring you guys more episodes. Absolutely. One day I'm going to get you both on the program so we can really have some fun with it. Thanks a lot, my friend. Oh man, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. This is No Man in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. Welcome back to the program. This is our number two. Thank you to Damian Adams, who I had on the show uh, once before. I'm going to have him on next week. And uh, don't forget to follow all of the programming put on by yours truly. By giving a follow to SNW Digital Media. That's SNW Digital Media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Pinterest. Every once in a while, while I'm busy going about my day, something comes across my screen, something comes across my desk that friends will send me one friend in particular, and I've sent some things to him and told him to go for it. Well, the friend is Cole Johnson, and he sent me something with the message, throwing the lob on the fast break. Send it in like Shaq, my man. Now, anyone who knows me knows I love Shaquille O'Neal. Loved him as a player. He's an absolute goofball. Love that big man. Especially love the way he played center. I read the caption, which says, The Warriors dynasty was fraudulent. It was all because of KD. Well, that got my spider senses going right then and there. And then I listened to the clip. This is courtesy, and I'm going to let you all hear a few seconds of it before I provide a response. This is courtesy of Undisputed on FS1, and the fellow who was making the comment is a friend of mine, Rob Parker, part of The Odd Couple, one of the shows I actually like. Rob Parker said this. Read my lips. The Warriors uh, dynasty, whatever you want to call it, has been officially eliminated once Kevin Durant left. It's not happening. I do not see the Warriors winning anything anytime soon. And it has nothing to do. You can talk about adding all the players about the lottery picks and Wiggins. It's about Steph and Clay. It's about the those Mad guys. Whatever. Yeah, well, whatever you want to call it, that whole dynasty that everybody talks about is totally fraudulent. Oh, God. The only reason they, they had a dynasty? No, the only reason they had a dynasty is because KD joined the team. Steph, Clay, and Draymond Green, they won one championship. That was without uh, Kyrie Irvin and Kevin Love. That's the one that they won. Iguodala was the MVP, not Steph, not Clay. Hold on. And, the, and then they played Cleveland and were the first team. That was the 73 and 9 team. Games. That's right. Wow. Regular That's season. Good. But they choked down the NBA Finals. The first team in the history of the NBA to choke down a 3 to 1 lead. They lost two of the three games at home. Yeah. They lost three games in a row. They hadn't lost three games in a row all year. It's a fraudulent dynasty. Unless Kevin Durant's coming back, they're not winning again. Stop the romanticizing of Steph and Clay. Let me give you Steph's. You ready? Listen. Well, to say the least, 
I love I, I, I Rob Parker's cool, okay? I had him on my show. But when I heard that, and y'all know I'm a Golden State Warrior fan, that pissed me off. And it leads to this. It's time to go. Let's go in, shall we? The Warriors dynasty was fraudulent, according to Rob Parker. The Warriors dynasty was because of KD, according to Rob Parker. Um, Mr. Parker, I guess you didn't realize that Stephen Curry and Klay Thompson and Draymond Green were drafted by the Warriors in the process of their rebuild from 2009 to 2012. I guess you don't realize that Steph and Clay and Draymond are their core players. I guess you don't realize that it wasn't it wasn't the Warriors who made the call for KD to come to them. It was KD who made the call to the Warriors. I guess you don't realize that the Golden State Warriors have something LeBron's never had in 17 years. It's called a winning culture. I guess you don't realize that Stephen Curry, the current warrior, be injured as he may be, was a unanimous most valuable player and the only one in history to this juncture. I guess you don't realize that Stephen Clay knocked down 402 threes. I guess you don't realize that the Cleveland Cavaliers, to borrow from Stephen A. Stiff, were, Stephen A. Smith, I beg your pardon, were granted an enormous stimulus package in 2016. I guess you don't realize that the NBA has had it in for the Golden State Warriors. Okay, I'm going a little far. I guess you don't realize that the Cleveland Cavaliers were granted a stimulus package all the way from heaven in 2016. Everybody wants to say, oh, the Cavaliers uh, erased the three games to one deficit. They had help. Don't you realize that they had help? They had help from the NBA. They had help from LeBron James, who engineered the whole damn thing by dry snitching on Draymond Green for kicking him in the you-know-where when it was an accidental kick in the first place, and second, LeBron tried to walk over him. If you want to follow the letter to the law, then then the finals appearance in 2016 should not have happened because if you follow the letter of the law, according to the NBA, Draymond Green should have been suspended in the Western Conference Finals, not the NBA World Championship Series. And I laid it out as a conspiracy theory that because of that stimulus package, that's why Cleveland was able to get back in the series because if if Draymond Green plays in Game 5 of that World Championship Series, it's a walk-off. It's a five-game conquest. It's a five-game wipeout because every game in that series was this, because every game up to that juncture, the first four games were decided by double digits. The first two were wipeouts in Oakland. Cleveland wiped out the Warriors by 30 points in game three, and then the Warriors won by 11 in game four, one away to 97. Matter of fact, the first six games were decided by double digits in that 2016 World Championship Series. I guess you don't realize, Mr. Parker, that in order for the Warriors to get back to the World Championship Series, they had to erase a three games to one deficit of their own, and that was against the Oklahoma City Thunder, who had Kevin Durant at the time. If there was any kind of dynasty, it should have been formed in Oklahoma City. And to be more to the point, it should have been formed in Seattle. I have said it on this program, and I will continue to say it for as long as I'm alive. The Oklahoma City Thunder should not exist. It should still be the Seattle Supersonics, because the Seattle Supersonics had a 41-year history unfairly taken away from them by Clay Bennett and David Stern. Rest in peace, David Stern. I love you, but for that, I don't. 
the Seattle Supersonic should still be in operation. David Stern could have forked over the money needed to get a new arena in Seattle and place it anywhere he wanted to. He had the cash. It shouldn't have it should not have even gotten political. It should not have even gone to that point. If you want a dynasty, it should have started in Seattle. Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, all that should have been in Seattle, not Oklahoma City. Can you imagine the rivalry the Seattle Supersonics and the Golden State Warriors would have had? It would have been a, a rivalry that would have been that would have been groundbreaking. Beyond groundbreaking. I mean, who expected the Golden State Warriors to come out of nowhere, Mr. Parker? And I guess you forgot the fact that the Golden State Warriors came out of nowhere, Mr. Parker, after losing a seven-game series against the Los Angeles Clippers in the first round in 2014, Mr. Parker, to rise to power, win 67 games, and win the world championship on the Cavaliers' floor. Yeah. I guess you forgot all of that. I guess you forgot those facts. I guess you forgot the fact that the biggest rival, aside of the Cleveland Cavaliers, to this Warriors dynasty was the Houston Rockets. The Rockets had four shots at the Warriors, four of them. Four shots at the Warriors, and they failed each and every time. A five-game conquest in the Western Conference Finals in 2016. A five-game in 2015. I beg your pardon. A five-game a five-game win in the first round in 2016. A seven-game win in the Western Conference Finals in 2018, and a six-game conquest in the Western Conference Semifinals in 2019. And oh, by the way, Stephen Curry went off for 33 points in the second half of Game 6, the walk-off victory in Houston, Texas. But I guess you forgot all of that, didn't you, Mr. Parker? Mr. Parker, allow me to remind you that this dynasty is still in motion. This is an off year. Dynasties have had off years. Ask the Boston Celtics. Ask the Los Angeles Lakers, who lost to Houston in five games in 1986. Did anyone call that dynasty over? No. The Boston Celtics had an eight-year run as world champions, and then they lost. Did anybody call their dynasty over? No. They're still regarded as one because of the number of championships they have won the number of championships the los angeles lakers have won 17 and 16 if you're counting and this golden state warriors team is still young they still have the best ownership group in the business they still have the best set of players in the league it's not lebron's league it's not russell's league it's not russell westbrook it's not james harden's league no this league in current time belongs to the splash brothers and as big of a decision as Kevin Durant made to join the Golden State Warriors, he made the decision to leave them. Oh, by the way, Mr. Parker, have you figured out the fact that Kevin Durant's not playing this year or the possible fact that Kevin Durant could, may not play next year because of a serious injury? Or have you forgotten the fact that that injury happened because he was giving himself of himself to the Golden State Warriors? The Kevin Durant move to Golden State enhanced them the same way that Dennis Rodman going to Chicago enhanced the Bulls the same way that James Worthy a draft pick mind the way enhanced the Lakers the same way that Bill Walton who was drafted by the Portland Trailblazers in uh, by the Portland Trailblazers enhanced the Boston Celtics in 1986 the same way my friend that Having Sean Elliott return to the San Antonio Spurs after a stint with the Detroit Pistons enhanced the San Antonio Spurs in their dynastic run. And oh, by the way, have you figured out the fact that the Spurs never put three consecutive championships together and yet they are called a dynasty for their run? Have you ever figured out the fact that the Lakers 
who have repeated on a couple of occasions didn't have their dynasty called dead or fraudulent because of some of the players they had in their organization nor have the Spurs, the Bulls, the Celtics or anybody else that had a long run of championship excellence. In other words what I'm saying to you my friend is that championship excellence depend on the parts of a team. You understand that? As much as of a LeBron hater that you are and I give you credit for that you have to remember you can't hate Steph and the Warriors you can't hate Stephen Clay. You can't hate the Splash Brothers because they are part of a team. Just as Tim Duncan and David Robinson were. Just as Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen were. Just as Magic Johnson, Abdul Jabbar, and James Worthy were. Just as Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish were. And oh, by the way, there was a trade that the Boston Celtics made in 1984 that brought them the final piece to their championship puzzle after being swept the year before by the Milwaukee Bucks. That piece's name was Dennis Johnson. He was given to, he was traded to them courtesy of the Phoenix Suns. But I guess you forgot all of that, did you, Mr. Parker? Now, that's me. Go! I gotta take a break after all of that. This is No Man in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. He's back. And we're ready to talk all things <laughs> NBA <laughs> NBA All-Star Game. <laughs> William Morgan, one of my basketball aficionados, is back. How are you, my friend? Hey, nice to be back, man. Okay. I talked about this on Friday with my buddy Michael Lyle and one of my good friends, Darnell Sollins. Mm. Who the hell came up with these rules for this year's All-Star Game? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the thing that kills me, they're doing it to me. They're doing it to try to increase viewership, but the thing about it, the names are so big, you're going to get it. You're going to get views from it regardless. Mm-hmm. Why can't That's it be? Me. Why can't it be East and West again? Right. Can we just go back to East and West? Uh, that, that, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. Particularly with the way Giannis picks, he's picking his best friends. Yes. This is why I don't like the captains. This is exactly why I don't like the captains. Because remember, the first year it was LeBron and Steph. And yep. to be perfectly honest, Steph got screwed out of a couple of great players to be on his team. He did. Steph got screwed, okay? He did. He did. So why can't it be just East and West? I, I guess the East got tired of getting beat up by the West. Like if you want if you want to be the team, beat the team. Exactly. Why don't people get this concept? Exactly. And now, and, 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 and 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 to be fair, Giannis probably been thinking the same way you were thinking mm -hmm. because most of that team is from the Eastern Conference. Yes. So it should be East and West anyway. They just yep. need to call it East and West and, and, and be done. This year's All-Star Game is in Chicago, my hometown. Mm -hmm. It's in the United Center. Last time it was in Chicago, it graced old Chicago Stadium. That, of course, was 1988. Here are the rules as I understand them, and you're allowed to laugh mm -hmm. at any given time that I try to explain this. Okay. Each team, each quarter begins 0-0. Zero, zero. Mm -hmm. So if Team LeBron beats Team Giannis, say, 30-25, to 25, then Team LeBron wins $100,000 for the charity of their choice. Okay. Then you reset the <laughs> score. Yeah, you know, you, you know this is going to sound crazy. Then you reset the score for quarter two. And if Giannis beats LeBron by that same score, then Team Giannis wins $100,000 for the charity of their choice. You reset the score again, 
for yeah. quarter three. And remember, uh. each of the first three periods are twelve minute quarters. You reset mm-hmm. for period yep. three, and if LeBron wins, if Team LeBron wins again, then they get a hundred thousand bucks for their charity. Now, if mm-hmm. the quarter ends in a tie, then you roll the money over to the next quarter, and whoever wins the quarter get wins the whole pot for their charity. Right, folks. I'm as tongue-tied as you are <laughs> trying to <laughs> decipher this mess. <laughs> Uh, no, what happened here's to the, the kicker. Here's the kicker. I didn't give you the best part. The first three quarters uh, are 12-minute quarters, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The fourth quarter is an untimed quarter. So they take the cumulative score of the first three mm-hmm. periods, say Team LeBron leads 85-80. All Team LeBron would have to do to win the game and this is where they honor Kobe, is tack on 24 points. There you go. So if Team LeBron scores, a whoever scores 109, and this is the example that I was given, then that team would win the All-Star game. I have so many questions, which begin with, why the hell wouldn't you keep the running score anyway? Right. <laughs> right. I don't get it. What what ha- what has happened to the days of us having a traditional All Star weekend? Now, if you want to do a slam dunk competition, the three point shootout, um, you can do a big man's competition. You can do a one on one, which I would love to see mm-hmm. um, between certain players. I mean, bring, uh, and then you do the traditional All Star game. Bring back, you know something? Bring back the old timers game. Yes. You got enough folks. Now. Bring back the old timers game, okay? Yep. That was one of the features of the weekend. I'm, I'm with you. You play two halves, make it a running clock. You're good. Bring back the old I'm timers game. This. I'm with you. This skills competition, for lack of a better term, to me, mm-hmm. is boring. <laughs> it is. It is. I understand the slam dunk. I understand the three-point competition, and nothing will top 1988 when Michael Jordan won in front of his hometown hometown fans. Okay. Oh yeah. That's when oh, Michael yeah. Jordan tore the roof off the joint. Yep. What has happened? And, and I'm I, I plan to have Courtney Harden on later this week to discuss this same subject that we discussed a few years ago. What has happened to All Star Weekend? What has happened to the luster? That is All Star Weekend. <sighs> corporate spot, corporate, I believe, plays their hand in it, so mm-hmm. to speak. Mm-hmm. And certain players, and certain players, not wanting to compete, or certain players dropping out after they said they would compete that you would want to see. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that those are the two biggest factors on why this All Star Weekend isn't what it used to be. And it's just a damn shame because I can remember, man, like it was yesterday, um, Dominique, Spud, Jordan, all those for the oh, slam dunk nice. competition. But, but yet and still, yet and still, you got LeBron James who won't do it. You know what? I've always had a problem with that. I understand. <laughs> Look, MJ put in his, his years as a slam dunk king. All right. Mm-hmm. He had nothing mm-hmm. more to prove on that realm. Then, of course, he goes on and wins six championships. Mm-hmm. He had nothing left to prove. Why mm-hmm. do you think LeBron James will not get in the slam dunk competition? What's up with that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not now in year 17, but back when it was year 9, year 10. He could have easily eight, participated. He could have easily yep. participated. Yep. And let's not forget it. Let's not forget this also. Jordan embarrassed himself in the three point competition. Yeah, he did. But at least he went out there. And, but at least he went out there and tried. Mm-hmm. When Braun can't try to slam dunk. And it, you would think it would be one of his specialties. Yeah. You would think yeah. it would be one of his specialties. Here's a funny yeah. moment. Here's a funny moment, and I I know a lot of LeBron fans are going to get on me about this, but. 
you want a Kobe in the Staples Center, if you're the Lakers and Lakers fans, I'd be a little upset for this reason. You want a Kobe on a Friday night, a full house, a lot of folks watching outside, and then you go out and lay an egg against the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, that's a problem. They laid it. They laid a big fat egg against the Portland Trailblazers. They that's allowed a hundred. They allowed a hundred twenty-seven points to the Portland Trailblazers. And also, if you're a Lakers fan, yeah. I'd be worried about this. You're playing in the worst team in the league in the Golden State Warriors. Why did you allow them to hang around on Saturday night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why and did the you Lakers allow them? Are to, playing, they're not playing their best ball right now. No, they're what? They're playing 500 ball the last 11, 12 games. They're yes. playing 500 ball right now. So they're not looking very, very good. <clears throat> and in many, and ways, neither new, are the, in many ways, neither are the Clippers. They got smashed by the Minnesota Timberwolves on oh Saturday yeah. night. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, if yeah. You're, if but, you're but, playing the worst team in the league, and I go back to the Lakers, if you're playing the worst team in the league and you allow mm-hmm. them to hang 120 points on you, yeah, you win by five mm-hmm. in San Francisco. But remember, this is the same Warriors team playing shorthanded that beat the Houston Rockets by a dozen on Christmas Day. Yep. Yep. Amen. Amen. They should be they, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be getting up. They play down to their competition, mm-hmm. and they should have. And, and, they and should that's have. and for me, that's always been an issue with LeBron playing down Mm -hmm. to his competition. I'm sorry, I have to speak it the way it is truthfully seen by my eyes. It just seems that with LeBron, even though he's in year 17, he plays down to his competition. He plays down to his competition. He's always, since he's been in the NBA, and we're talking about an incredible 17-year career, we're talking about since 2003, doesn't it seem to you, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth at all, but just follow me here. Doesn't it seem huh? to you like he's playing down to his competition instead of up? Yes. Yes. So I believe you. So why has he not gotten the message yet that he has a bullseye on his back and has for 17 years? He needs to, because a lot of these games, everybody keeps saying that LeBron is this, LeBron is that better than Jordan. But the thing that's killing LeBron, I think it's his thought process in these games. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming out and taking over and setting the tone for for his team and getting AD in, and, and, and he's trying to pass too much. He's trying to defer too much. Yeah. Uh, AD is fine because you got to feed AD in the post. That's fine. Absolutely. But we, but when you're trying to get guys, other guys who've come up short this year, i.e. Kyle Kuzma, mm-hmm. you, you can't do that. You need to come out and be the tone setter. Get your own game going. Once you get your game going and your shot falling, then you go ahead and start facilitating to, uh, to AD and other people. But get your game going first. And a lot of times on LeBron, you don't see that. You really don't. And he's so afraid, in my opinion, in a lot of games, he's so afraid to get his game going because he doesn't want to take away from others. And that part I don't understand. That's a lot of MJ, okay? But oh, the yeah. difference is, oh, yeah. But the difference is, Michael knew he can take over a game at any given time. Exactly. The biggest difference exactly. is Michael knew he can take the game over at any time. So and you're even seeing, and if you even look at, and I'm going to cut you off, but even if you look at LeBron, he's even being exploited defensively. Yeah, he's been exploited defensively for the last five years. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants to go back, go back to that chase down block in 2016 when he got Andre Iguodala. And I'm so sad that I'm so glad the next year the Warriors got even, but that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> like, oh, that's the greatest defensive play I've seen in finals history. Please. I've seen much better, much earlier. Uh, apparently, 
if that's the greatest defense play, the chase down block by LeBron, is that the greatest? If that is the greatest defense play that you see in the NBA World Championship Series, obviously you haven't seen Larry Bird do his thing. Obviously you haven't seen oh, Magic yeah. Johnson or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar do his thing. Obviously you haven't seen oh, yeah. the bad boy Detroit Pistons do their thing. The Bulls, the Spurs. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah mm-hmm. I'm going there. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going all the way there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Obviously you haven't seen those teams do their thing. Okay? Yep. And even at, though they lost the other night, and even though they lost the other night, I still like the Clippers coming out of the West. Yeah. Because their their strengths are a they got that dog in them, but b look at look at what they hit you with. Mm-hmm. They hit you with the start, and then they bring Morris. They bring Lou Williams off the bench. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And while the Lakers are and the Lakers are long yep. and they're tall as a team, but, but they're, they're short on the bench. Right. They're sure on the bench. You can't count on Rondo anymore. No. Nope. I don't know what you you might get some you might get something off Caruso, um, because he'll probably take Rondo's minutes now. But for the most part, I am I'm, I'm loving the Clippers right now. I'm Clippers Bucks, I'm calling it now. You know something? Here is a move the Lakers should have made, and I said this on Friday's NBA podcast. And I'm mm-hmm. saying it now. And I think you'll agree with me. The fact that the Lakers didn't even blink trying to get Andre Iguodala is an indictment against the Lakers. I think it's more on an indictment on the fact that (laughs) they're trying to keep their core. And they look at they look at Danny Green. They look at Kyle Kuzma as part of their core. And you look at LeBron. You 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 look at Kuz. You look at Danny Green. Look at AD. That's what they want. Anybody else is up for trade. The problem is nobody else wants those players. No. And I wouldn't either. That's the problem. And I wouldn't yeah, either. That's the problem. I wouldn't want them either. I mean, why would you mm-hmm. even take that? Why would you even take that chance? No. Nope. Why would you even take that chance? And again. I say that the lack of moves by the Lakers, especially when Andre Iguodala has been available all season, is an indictment against the Lakers because it shows me they don't want to win because they had a chance to get a proven winner. Nothing against LeBron, nothing nothing against AD, nothing against um, Rajon Rondo. But you had a chance to get a proven winner in Andre Iguodala. Three championships in five seasons. He was in the best yep. culture. He was in the best basketball culture for eight years, and you didn't Agreed. go after him. Why? Another thing that another thing that's indicted that, that's kind of got me upset too. If you really, really wanted to trade Kyle Kuzma, they didn't showcase him at all. Nope. You could have showcased him within that second unit, but mm-hmm. they didn't do it. Nope. And they don't want to do it. My feeling is they don't they don't want to do it. They want to hold on to him in case some even bigger trade bait or or free agency bait comes around, i.e. Carl Anthony Towns. But I'm gonna tell you but something see, I'm, thinking, I'm gonna tell you something mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't think will happen, but I think will. Mm-hmm. Carl Anthony Towns mm-hmm. will end up in the bay. I think so too. I think so too. I think so, because now they have assets. Now they have assets to yep. do by getting rid of um, D'Angelo. So they have some assets. So uh, mm-hmm. I can see that happening. They, and they, and they Rob snatched, Flinker, They snatched Andrew Wiggins. The Warriors snatched Andrew Rig- Wiggins in a one-on-one trade for D'Angelo Russell. Now, Russell yep. is busy, pr- has been proving himself all year. I understand that. But the Warriors need mm-hmm. some depth on that bench. And they're getting it. And well, they're also getting a lot of draft picks. Here is the biggest piece of the puzzle that I see happening this summer, and if I'm totally wrong, I am totally wrong. Mm-hmm. All these draft picks that the Warriors have available, mm-hmm. they'll be a, I say they will still be able to get Carl Anthony Towns and not sacrifice one of them. Ugh. They might. They might. It may if they cost anything for Golden State, 
it'll be the same kind of deal that the 49ers made for Jimmy Garoppolo. Give up a second round pick yes. and you get your franchise quarterback. They'll give up right. a second. The Warriors yeah. will give up a second round pick, if not two, and they'll get mm-hmm. another franchise player that they can keep in their system for a good four to five years because they have their core. They have their mm-hmm. core. They got Stephen Curry. They got Clay Thompson. They got Draymond Green. Okay? Mm-hmm. And Green is the only one mm-hmm. that's been healthy all year long. My yep. point is they can easily, easily talk to Minnesota and say, look, we'll give you a few second-round picks if you give us Carl Anthony Towns because now you get Minnesota thinking young again. They already gave up Andrew Wiggins for a song, and I got nothing against D'Angelo Russell at all. Don't get me wrong. Nothing against D'Angelo yeah, Russell all. at all. <laughs> yep. Nothing against D'Angelo Russell at all. But at the same yeah. time, at the same time, the Warriors are thinking four or five years down the road when they rule the yep. roost again. I have a feeling yep. this summer Carl Anthony Towns will come to San Francisco, and he won't even blink I, when they make their offer. I can see that. I can see that. I can see that because it's a winning culture. And they'll have Andrew Wiggins there to be Harrison Barnes 2.0. Yep. So I, I, I can definitely see that. And I you, can definitely see that. And you can see the Warriors rebuilding right in front of our eyes, and no one will, no one will say it. No one will say it because everybody – that thinks they're an NBA fan, and you and I have spoken about this before, any and everybody that thinks they're an NBA fan are celebrating the fact that the Warriors are having an awful season in the midst of their dynasty. And they're still a dynasty Mm -hmm. because they've won three titles in five years. This is a horrible year because they lost Kevin Durant to free agency. You lose Klay Thompson in the World Championship Series. You lose Stephen Curry at the top of the season. I mean, what are you going to do? You're without three of your best players. And Kevin Durant hasn't played one minute this season, and I don't think he'll play one minute next season. I don't think he'll play for two years. And he's going to languish in Brooklyn. Unless that injury heals the way it is supposed to heal and the way he wants it to heal, because you're talking about one of the most gifted, athletic seven-footers with a consistent jump shot. Pay attention, LeBron. With a consistent (laughs) jump shot that can knock it down from anywhere as well as post people up, that that ACL injury is going to mess him up for two years. Because if you look at all the reports... And if you know anything about physiology, that MCL injury takes two years to heal. Two years. So Clay Thompson is lost for this year. We all know that. He's probably going to be yep. back in October because we uh, the Warriors lost him in June. Okay? Mm-hmm. So when June comes around, it'll be one full year. You give him another five months on top of that, he'll be fine. Stephen Curry will be fine. Yeah. Kevin Durant won it. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and he still won't be 100%. He might be maybe, what, 80, 85? If that. Yeah. If that. He won't be 100%. He won't be 100%. And also. Yeah, he may have to adjust. Now to adjust his game a little bit. And, my, and also, who's to say Kyrie Irving will be there after this year? The way this year is going. Man, forward. look. Man, look. I am a, <laughs> I am a spitzer. I am a spitzer. Uh, Spencer Dunwoody fan. Mm-hmm. Dunwoody, I'm sorry. And I, I am a big fan of his. He's doing it when he's not, when Irving's not in there. He's been tasked the job of running the team and he's been doing a doggone good job and making a lot less money. So if Kyrie Irving got Kyrie Irving can't come back, hey, so be it. Then we, um, he's been doing a great job. He's been doing a fantastic job. And if he can't come back or can't come back healthy, you know, hey, you have somebody there who can run that point guard position. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the the Nets are a mess. Even though they're competing oh, yeah. for a playoff spot right now. Huge mess. They can Huge get, mess. Here's the point with, with the Nets. They can get to April, but this team won't get beyond April. Big problem. No. Can, can you imagine if the Nets was over in the West? It was the chance coming out of the West. They were not, not have, one shot coming out of the West. Not a chance at all. Not a chance mm-hmm. at all. Not with the way this team's constructed. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And there's a whole lot of disappointing teams in the league this year. Mm-hmm. Um, the, Nets are, the, the Nets are so much disappointing. You look at the Philadelphia 76ers, oh, very disappointing, given the talent on that team. 
Miami's gotten stronger. Toronto's holding pack. Um, and of course, the Bucks. It's just the Bucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're playing good basketball right now. Uh, that's the that's the team to beat right now. That's the team to beat. Well, you mentioned a team that I have not been sold on since they drafted Ben Simmons, and that's the Philadelphia 76ers. Mm-hmm. I said earlier in the season that Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid will cost Philadelphia more than enhance them. Ben Simmons can't make a jump shot. Joel Embiid's taking too many jump shots. He won't camp in the lane. <laughs> and another thing I don't understand about Joel Embiid, he be having the, the craziest injuries or reasons why he can't play. Ever. Right. It's like, what, stomach flu, stomach virus? Not saying that it's not devastating, but, bro, how old are you? Yeah. Yeah, that can, that can happen to anybody. Here's another Here's another move the Lakers should have made, and they didn't. Why didn't they go after Derrick Rose? Because the Lakers are in desperate need in, of a point guard right now. Rajon Rondo is there's not the answer. There's a story out there, too, that I think – Detroit wanted Caruso was going to give him Rose. Maybe denied it. I wonder who denied that deal. I, I don't know. It could have been Palika. It could have been no, Bus. It, it ain't, could have it been Bogle. I don't know. Listen, it ain't Palinka. <laughs> you and I both know, and by that evil laugh, you already know the answer. Palinka didn't deny that <laughs> trade. Come on. Who the, who the hell do you think denied uh, that trade? Yeah, we we knew it was. Who, the, was who the hell do you think, <laughs> whose name ain't Rob Palenka or Jeannie Bus, put the kibosh on that move? It was Bron. <laughs> it was Bron. And, and, and then if he did put the kibosh on it, it was stupid. Derrick Rose is playing very very well right now. Yeah, and he he could have he could have been a benefit to to the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Um, inside out, inside outside game. Um, Danny Green posting up for three, some driving, penetrating, kicking back out to him, hitting, setting him up for the three point shot. Uh, but you you don't can't do that now because he, he he's gone. He's no, nope. he's still at Detroit. In, and two moves were there for Los Angeles to make. They could have gotten Derrick Rose, and they couldn't got mm-hmm. they could have gotten Andre Iguodala. And I'm yep. willing to bet you. I'm willing to bet you. There is one person and one person only who put the kibosh on both of those trades. Ron. Yep. And and I got a I have another rumor in my head of why. They're going after Ben Simmons. Mm. Whoa. I have this I have this strange feeling cuz Ben Simmons is a part of clutch sports. He is. They made it. Yeah. Who do you think? Yeah, he may yeah. have signed an extension with Philadelphia. But who do you think? And and I, I and, and nothing against the players, okay? This is just what I feel. Who do huh? you think sniffing around trying to get Ben Simmons on this team? Oh yeah. No uh, other you, team. You're wrong. Yeah, no other team wants Ben Simmons for the simplest of fact. Ben Simmons, for the life of me, cannot hit a jump shot. And I don't understand it either because I looked at him early in the season when he was over at. Um, over with Rico Hines doing those Rico Hines runs, he wasn't even trying to shoot then. Nope, and he ain't trying to shoot so now. No, nah, I don't get it. I don't understand it. You have to con- con- to continue to develop your game, and for some reason, it's like even if you get a mid range, the the model Rose has got a mid range. Even if you get a mid range game, it mm-hmm. will serve you well. He don't even have that. DeMar DeRozan's career is going to last a lot longer than Ben Simmons' career is because Ben Simmons, if he doesn't get traded to the Lakers, within two years, Ben Simmons is finished. I think I think he'll be I think he'll be regarded as a bust um, if something doesn't happen within the next couple of years because if he's not going to take it upon himself to develop that jumper, at least Giannis. Developed the jump shot. Yep. You see, Giannis taking more outside shots now. Um, 
that's what Ben Simmons needs to do. That's what Zion needs to do. And I don't understand and why I'm these players don't high want on, to develop a and, and I'm not too high on Zion either. I've never been I high on I'm, Zion Williamson. He... You know what? Th- we'll close with this point, and I want your I want your mm-hmm. thought on this before we close up shop here. Zion mm-hmm. Williamson is playing out of position. He is playing yeah. way out of position. If he were to lose yeah. forty pounds and really get in basketball shape and develop a jump shot, he could be a two guard. Easy, easy. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the handles to be a point guard. He doesn't have the jump shot to pull. He can pose people up, yeah, because of his sheer size. Right. But, but, people will figure that out in a heartbeat. Just ask Harrison Barnes. <laughs> he knows all about that. <laughs> he knows all about getting figured out. Just ask, Har- just ask I've Harrison gone, Barnes. I've gone on. A, I've gone out and said I think Ja Morant's going to be a better rookie and a better overall player mm-hmm. between the two. Between the two, because he won't have the the weight issues that Zion's going to be facing with each and every year um, of his career. Uh, and particularly when he got drafted, because he got drafted, he's with a, he's with the Pelicans. You yeah. know that he's good down in New Orleans mm-hmm. now. All that interest there, and all that, um, and all that red and red and black combo. And, and that's what everybody was afraid there. of. That's what everybody yeah. was afraid of when Zion got yeah. drafted. And why did it take this long? His weight is a problem. Yep. yep. <clears throat> and John ja may and John ja may stay in the game maybe ten more pounds of muscle, but outside of that. Oh, I think Ja's going to be a, 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 a better player than Zion, Zion overall. Ja is more developed than Zion yep. is. Ja actually yep. has a jump shot. Ja mm-hmm. actually has court knowledge. Mm-hmm. Ja actually is willing to make his game better. And then on the other end, despite his slender size, he does put effort on defense, too. That he does. He's going to be a defensive dynamo when he really gets developed. Got to go to a break, but let me thank William Morgan for coming on to the program, Talk All Things NBA. You'll hear this conversation on the NBA podcast. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Have a great night. We got more for you after this. This is No Man in the Morning, where true sports talk lives. He did what? I did not need to be told that. I told you guys he'd be back, and he's back now to talk some more college hoops as we take a look inside of the Big Ten. This is Scoop Miller, courtesy of Learfield Sports and the Buckeye Cable Sports Network. How are you, my friend? Hey, fantastic. Great to be here. All right, let's take a look at the Big Ten, and I'm going to start with the surprise of the Big Ten, a team that is dear to my heart and still has a chance to win the darn thing. Who would have thunk it about the fighting Illini of Illinois? Yeah, what a tremendous uh, job for Brad Underwood this year. Uh, these guys, uh, they've really done a great job protecting home court. I think they're 12 and 3 right now at home, but they've won 7 of 10. I know, uh, they have a current three game losing streak, but they had won seven row be- before that. And, uh, you know, they've got a chance to really make some noise, make a dent in this NCAA tournament. There's a lot of people besides yourself, uh, back in Illinois, certainly excited about this team. Man, this is a young Illinois team that sent shockwaves throughout the Big Ten, and they did it early in the year when they knocked off Michigan. Yeah, that certainly was a a huge win there. Had to just do wonders for their confidence. You know, Michigan has had so much success, got off to such a great start this year as well. But, uh, you know, the Big Ten, you know, it's been so hard to win on the road. I think this year uh, going into uh, last night, uh, I think uh, just over 80% the games have won by the home team there in the Big Ten. So that's something that's certainly been huge. 
But uh, Illinois has showed they've been able to win away from uh, home as well. You know, they're, I think they have a 4-4 four and four record uh, on the road, which certainly for a Big Ten school is not, is not bad. You'll probably take it most yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, you but, will. Uh, they're 12-3 they're and three at the State Farm Center, 4-4 four and four away from home. They've lost three in a row. But no one, and I'll say it again before we move on to our next point, I'll say it again. No one expected Illinois to make this much noise. 16 and 8, chance for 20 for the first time in four seasons, and a chance to really make some noise in the Big Ten tournament and eventually the big dance in March. Yeah, I, I think there's no question. You know, I, I think, in all fairness, they, they definitely came in under the radar this year, which might have helped them uh, you know, get some key wins early. But right now, they're certainly on everybody's radar. You're not going to sneak up on on Illinois. They're not going to sneak up on you right now. The fact that uh, they've just been playing uh, too consistently, just too well all years. They've proven, uh, you know, this team is not a fluke. This team is a real deal. And certainly they have high aspirations and champagne like they should. And one team that they beat, that's one game behind them, what a win they had over Wisconsin. They took it to them. And that's one of those wins that's a signature win for them. And for Wisconsin, 17, the 7-6 and six in the Big Ten, 14-10 and 10 overall. But to outline something you talked about not only this time but earlier in the program, Wisconsin's 11-1 and one at the call center. The problem is they're 3-6 and six on the road. Yeah, I mean, uh, what can you say about Wisconsin playing at home? I think since the... Uh since the turn of the century in 2000, uh, their winning record at home there is over 87%, one of the tops in the nation. You know, that's just incredible. I think everybody knows what a rowdy place that is to try to go play. So certainly uh, Wisconsin's done a great job this year, 11-1, as you mentioned, at home. But, uh, you know, the Big Ten in general as well has, has been uh, just unbelievable the fact that the home team has held service, you know, 80% of the times this year. Even though I think the last couple of weeks we've seen the visitors break through more and more. We saw Purdue get a huge win at, at Michigan State, at Purdue here recently and so forth. Uh, we've, we've seen some, uh, we've, we've seen some, there just seems to be a lot of parity, I think, across the board. So, you know, you have to win at home. And if you're good enough to pull games out in the road, you're going to put yourself in pretty favorable position. Come March Madness. Well, unfortunately, two teams at the bottom of the Big Ten that are not in a favorable position, Nebraska and my other team in the Big Ten, my beloved Northwestern Wildcats, 1-11 and in the conference. Is Chris Collins on the hot seat at NU? Well, I tell you what, uh, it could be. You know, he, He's been there since uh, the 2013-14 season. And uh, I know they really had high aspirations as he took over. Uh, of course, his dad was always my idol growing up. I'll never forget him hitting those two big free throws against uh, the Russians in the 72 Olympics with a couple seconds left, only sure. uh, to lose on a very, very controversial finish. Yeah, uh, One that's stuck in my craw is a, probably as a fifth grader back then. But uh, but but certainly, uh, you know, the, the last few years has not been, I think, where they were expecting to be. So, you know, just really, you know, right now, 111 uh, in the Big Ten, factor 616 overall, and they've just, uh, they've been, uh, they, they've had some, some bad losses at home where they've been really blown out, you know, 20 plus points, and uh, certainly that's not going to sit well with alumni. But uh, you'd love to see him turn it around there. But, you know, right now, them and Nebraska certainly are the doormats of the Big Ten, no question about it. Yeah, I, w I would love to see Chris Collins turn it around. Duck Collins, of course, is whom he was referring to earlier. Hit two big free throws against the Russians. He was also uh, Michael Jordan's coach for the Bulls for uh, three seasons. So there's a lot of Chicago lineage there. Let's look in your backyard at Ohio State. Five and seven in the conference, though they're 15 and eight overall. Again, let's outline the point you talked about earlier. 11 and two at home, three and five on the road. That ain't good. Yeah, right now, Ohio State's kind of one of those uh, bubble teams, you know. Uh, you know, there's going to be four teams that have to play uh, right away in that Big Ten tournament, and certainly Nebraska Northwestern are going to be two of them. But the other 
two spots are going to be filled probably by either Ohio State, Indiana, or Michigan, two of those three schools. But I do like Ohio State, uh, not just because uh, I've lived here in the Buckeye State for the last 30 years, but the fact that I think Chris Holtman gets a lot out of his guys. Yeah, they play with a lot of energy. They're awfully good at home there. Uh, the Schottenstein Center has been really good to them. They're 11-2 this year, but they've had their uh, road woes just like a lot of other teams in the Big Ten. And uh, they went through a stretch here where they just could not buy a win. But the one thing I liked about Ohio State, even through the losses, they typically compete game in, game out. And uh, even in their losses, you know, it's not like they rolled over and they got beat by 20-some points to somebody. You know, these guys usually take it down the wire. They've had a tough time finishing. Uh, they've had a couple guys uh, uh, injured have not played this season. They had another guy that, uh, you know, stepped off for some medical reasons uh, to, to get his uh, kind of life in order. So, you know, they've, they've got some holes to fill. They're not going to use that excuse, but they certainly have a thin bench. And I think that's really kind of made it tough on them. But you have to like the way those guys fight game in, game out. I think somehow they're going to find a way uh, kind of sneak into that middle tier of the Big Ten. Well, they'll, they'll get one buy in the Big Ten tournament, but they certainly won't get the, the two buys. Those spots, I think, are going to be reserved for – I'm guessing right now, Maryland, Penn State, Michigan State, and Illinois. That's the four that's on top right now. And let's look at those top two, Maryland and Penn State. Maryland 20-4, and four, Penn State 19-5. and five. Each of those two teams coming into this week, they've won seven consecutive games. And Maryland has really taken off at the top of the Big Ten. Yeah, when you can... String together seven straight wins during the course of the Big Ten season. That's really speaking volumes. And, you know, whoever thought we'd talk about uh, Penn State and Maryland doing that uh, this season here. But uh, what a job Mark Turgeon's done with the Maryland uh, Turpins. And, and, of course, uh, the job Pat Chambers has done at Penn State there with the Nittany Lions. You know, those guys are 12-1 and at home. Maryland's 14-0 and at home. And uh, they've had a lot of success. You know, I really like the way those uh, teams are playing. You know, they've got some quality wins. They're certainly going to have an impressive resume when the uh, NCAA uh, tournament committee uh, decides the brackets for March Madness. Uh, so I, I like those two right there. And then, then the rest of it kind of gets interesting. You have a Michigan State team that's been up and down and, and always a dangerous tournament out. And, uh, of course, uh, Iowa's had a tremendous season. And uh, Illinois as well, you know, so it's certainly going to be a dogfight, I think, for those top four spots. But right now, I certainly I like the fighting Illini, I like the Spartans, and I like the Denny Lions, and, of course, I like Maryland. Those would be the top four, and I'm really cheering for Illinois to get one of those top four seeds in the Big Ten tournament. Let's look at Rutgers. Rutgers, 17-7, and 8-5 and five in conference play. And, again, highlighting a point, it's become a theme here of our conversations today, 16 and 0 in New Jersey. And 1 and 5 on the road. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's impressive, you know. Uh, anytime, I don't, I don't care who you are, but if you can hold service at home, especially in the Big Ten, that speaks volumes. So you know Rutgers certainly is a dangerous team. Uh, 17 wins on the season. You know, those. Uh, those guys have won. The Scarlet Knights have won 11 of the last 15 games, so they're starting to uh, get more and more confidence, I think, as this Big Ten season unwinds. They just have to get that signature win on the road. I think if they they can get that, I think that's really going to catapult them. They're certainly one of, I think, it's going to be 11 teams uh, that, that make the NCAA tournament for the Big Ten. How about Michigan? Do you think they have a shot at getting in the tournament? The season started so high. Of course, their new coach, uh, Juwan Howard, former uh, Michigan player, alumnus of, of Michigan, had them playing so well at the beginning of the season, and now you look at them, 5-7 and seven within the conference. They're 14-9 and nine overall. You expected some growing pains, but they're, they're playing, they were playing over their heads for uh, a, a really big portion of the season. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Snowman. I think they were. You know, there was so much hype with uh, Jawan Howard taking over this year. You know, he had so many, uh, especially the Cali J. Stewart, but a lot of alumni, they were certainly all behind that, and they certainly still are. And uh, those guys got out of the gates. They had some big wins early, and they really had momentum going their way. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've kind of hit a standstill here. 
And uh, they're one of those bubble teams. You know, right now they're really uh, fighting to stay out of that opening round game there in the Big Ten term. They're hoping to at least get that uh, one by, try to sneak in as maybe the uh, number 10 seed or so. But uh, they certainly, there's, that's no guarantee. They're going to have to somehow find a way to uh, finish above Ohio State and Indiana, who both right now have identical 5-7 records in the Big Ten. So certainly, you know, this is a fun time of year because – all these games certainly mean a lot uh, down the stretch here, and, and you're playing really, uh, you know, for your your tournament success here. You want to set yourself up to not have to play in that opening round of that Big Ten tournament. So uh, I think the Wolverines have their hands full, but but certainly uh, uh, Jawan Howard knows that. Uh, you know, he's got some good guys. They just really haven't quite messed as I think they thought they would after such a great start. It's the road to Bankers Life Fieldhouse in Indianapolis, Indiana, the site of the Big Ten Men's Basketball Tournament from March 11th through 15th. That man was Scoop Miller, giving you all the lowdowns and the highs of the Big Ten. He was on earlier to talk a little action on their road to the conference tournament that's held in Cleveland. Great to have you on, my friend. I certainly hope to have you on more as we take everybody to and through March Madness until a champion is crowned in Atlanta. Well, you know, Snowman, I always love talking hoops. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, you're right now you're living a dream. You get to go out and, and watch these games. You get you get paid to talk about them, and uh, you see some quality basketball, and you see teams and players, you know, fighting to continue to play on. You know, some of these college seniors are trying to, trying to get that W just to keep playing, not only to make the tournament, to keep going the tournament. And uh, you leave, you see guys leave it all out there on the floor each and every night. It doesn't get much better than that. And, uh, you know, what a great seat in the house to have. But, uh, but we've got some great basketball here in the Midwest, you know, with the Mac right in our backyard and the Big Ten. And uh, we've been treated some great games. Uh, you know, got a chance to see uh, Bob Knight come back to uh, Assembly Hall just recently. Uh, what a <laughs> What a moment there, and, and IU, you know, kind of a long time coming. Uh, it's been a been a tough ride here for the Hoosiers, but uh, certainly seeing Bob Knight there uh, brought back a lot of great memories for the uh, fine people of Indiana. Scoop Miller joining me to talk some college hoops. As mentioned, we take you to and through the championship weekend at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Good to talk to you, my friend. Hey, it's my pleasure, Snowman. Thanks for having me on. I'm not done yet, folks. We got some more for you in a flash. This is Snowman in the Morning. <laughs> where true sports talk lives. <laughs> I like him. He's silly. Welcome back to the program, everybody. Hope you're enjoying it as we're enjoying bringing it to you. You know, I am a fan of podcasts. I record them, I produce them, and I listen to them, a lot of them. And this one got my attention, and you guys know that I've begun to recommend a lot of good podcasts for y'all to listen to. Well, this one not only involves sports, it also involves life, and when I listen to it, I knew, well, when I heard about it, I knew I had to listen to it. I listened to it. I became a subscriber immediately, and I'm going to recommend this even before we get this done. The lady that I have on the line is the author of said podcast, Combining Football and Life. And when you listen to this podcast, you're going to get a lot out of it, and I recommend you not only sign up for it, download it, I, I just recommend everything about it. This is Jennifer Garrett, and she joins me right now. How are you doing? Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Okay, you got to tell me how you put this podcast together. What gave you the idea, and what what gave you the inspiration to put it together? Sure. So my podcast is called Move the Ball, and that name was taken from a book that I wrote uh, seven years ago. And the book was about how you could take football lessons specifically and apply them off the field to be successful in business and in life. And after the book was published, I spent the last seven years really working with people on how to move the ball 
and um, and really grow that brand. And, and I decided that I wanted to do the podcast because it was just another great way to connect with people having great conversations with professional athletes of all sports, as well as business leaders on how we can use the athlete mentality and put into practice success strategies and habits so that we can get ourselves to the next level. You started the podcast the day after the Super Bowl. You really, you really pumped it up. And I have to tell you, I, I really enjoy it. I know I'm going to enjoy it a lot. Um, what got you into football? What got you started in liking football? Great question. So I grew up in Chicago uh, in the 80s. I just fell in love with the game. You know, Ever since I was four, I would watch football games with my parents. And what really intrigued me about the sport was not only the fast-paced nature of the game, but also there were these games where you would have these fourth-quarter comebacks where teams mm-hmm. were down you know, two, three, four touchdowns. And the game wasn't over until the game clock hit zero. And so I just found that fascinating and studied the sport my entire life and applied lessons from the game into my own life. That is great. So you grew up a ba- you grew up a fan of the Bears back in the 80s, huh? Because I, too, am from Chicago. And I've seen, I've seen the Bears over, uh, over, over many, many years. Are there any other teams that you follow aside of the Bears? Uh, professional or college or either? Either one. So I am an Alabama alum, so I very much follow the University of Alabama football team. We had a rough, uh, rough season here this past season, but they'll be back next year for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I could have you on the show, and all I have to say is roll tide and off to the races we go. How about, how about a professional aside of the Bears? Do you follow anyone else? Uh, you know, there's a lot of teams that I like to watch. Um, I think there's some great uh, leaders who are great people both on and off the field. So it's not just the talent, but it's the character. You know, everyone talks about Tom Brady, right, and how great he was in New England. We'll see where he ends up going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do enjoy watching that team because of the leadership. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like watching the Well, people have hated on my team because – my original team in professional uh, football was the 49ers, and because of a fellow named Joe Montana, who Tom Brady gets compared to all the time. So I completely understand, you know, the hatred, but I draw the same comparison that people do with Tom Brady and the Patriots. It's because of the way that uh, Montana led his team on the field and the way the organization is run. And a lot of that you can apply to what you do with your, what you do with your podcast, which is very motivational, and I absolutely love it. And the lessons that you bring, you know, you can, like you said, you can apply it to life. Yeah. So I think, you know, I do like watching the Patriots. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great teams. I, I do like Andy Reid. You know, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs Absolutely. For, uh, for winning the Super Bowl. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is just a class, class act. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed watching the game, you know, the organization. Um, I've, there's some NFC East teams that I like watching, you know, the mm-hmm. Eagles, I like watching the Cowboys. And so, I mean, I, I'm just a, a fan of the game, and I love watching good games, so I don't just sit yes. down and watch the Bears play. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Talking with Jennifer Garrett, I love a phrase that I happened to catch when I was doing my, my research for this interview, and I, I love how you put this. Quote, you are the quarterback, your life is the game. Own it and move the ball. There's your purpose right there for for your podcast. Who are some of the guests that you've taped episodes with or are going to tape episodes with so far? Sure. So the first three episodes were released uh, just this past week. The first one was just a solo of me, but I had on the show already Chris Leak. Chris was the quarterback who led the Florida Gators to their national championship in the Mm -hmm. 2006 season so he was right before tim tebow um tebow was a freshman when chris was a senior taking that team to their championship also i I had on uh terrence wood who is the grandson of hall of famer pro football hall of famer willie wood Mm -hmm. who played for the packers in the 1960s uh some other guests that i've recorded with already paul pratt paul played with the detroit lions and he's got a great organization called Second Wind Mentors, where he mentors young boys of single-parent homes 
currently. So we had a great episode. Another gentleman, Tony Simmons. Tony played on the Patriots. He played on a number of teams. He was nicknamed Touchdown Tony. Played at Wisconsin mm-hmm. for um, college ball. Some future guests that are coming up as well. Uh, Eric Dungy, who is the son of Tony Dungy. Well, we're going to be recording an episode here in a couple of weeks. Um, but it's not just football athletes. So I've also got a pro skateboarder, Mikey Taylor, who I recorded a show with. His episode will come out early March. Um, also, Rob Murray. Rob played in the National Hockey League and the American Hockey League for many years. He's currently coaching the Tulsa Oilers, which is a minor league hockey team. So my goal is really a good cross-section of athletes from all sports. Absolutely wonderful. Again, this is Jennifer Garrett. You can find her you can find her podcast on anywhere where you listen to. It's called Move the Ball. It's the Move the Ball podcast and it's absolutely wonderful. Tell everybody where they can find you, my dear. Yeah, so the easiest way, I mean, it, it's going to be on all the platforms, or it is on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. But if you just go to movetheballpodcast.com, you can listen to it directly there, and there are links to all of those other podcasting platforms. Jennifer Garrett joining me here on the program to talk Move the Ball and how she uses football to move the ball in life, and you can do the same thing. Absolutely great having you on. i got to have you on again soon. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate being on the show today. This is No Man in the Morning. Where true sports talk lives. I like him. He's silly. All right, folks. There's a young man that I have not had on the show in over a week, and now that the season has concluded, I get to have him on again because we kind of missed a connection. Mike DeBay joins me, and Mike, have you got your ears on, my friend? <laughs> always, always for you, my friend. I've got my ears on. I'm locked and loaded and ready to go. It's uh, been a long time since we've spoken, but uh, all good, and uh, I always love coming on. Thank you for having me on, Brian. Man, I love, I love having you on. This is Mike DeBay, the full press coverage. Of course, he joins me to talk NFL. The season has concluded. Chiefs and the 49ers. Let's start with the world champion Chiefs. They 21 points in six minutes. Nothing but praise for both of these teams and one hell of a Super Bowl that they put on. Yeah, tremendous game for both teams, if you think about it. When you look at it, 49ers definitely had their chances. The Chiefs credit them. Uh, come from, tip your cap to both teams. Uh, Patrick Mahomes definitely showed that he is among, if not a top, of the elite quarterbacks in this league. Um, can't say enough about the game that he had. Uh, Damian Williams, uh, as a running back for the Kansas City Chiefs, was phenomenal in this game. You can make the argument that he could have uh, been considered for the MVP along with Mahomes. I don't think they necessarily made a bad decision by giving it to Patrick, but uh, Williams, I thought, had a tremendous game as well. Got to credit the Kansas City defense. They made stops when they needed to. I thought on the San Francisco side, I thought they played very well on defense, well enough to win this. Um, just unfortunately, it came down to uh, Kansas City making more plays than uh, – than, than, San, uh, than San Francisco did in the latter part of the game. So uh, a great Super Bowl, a uh, great victory for the uh, the Chiefs. But uh, if you're a Niners fan, fear not. This team's going to be back, and they're going to be ready to go in 2020. And don't be surprised. And I, I said this right after the game. You know, I, I, I went to bed, and my wife said, did the 49ers win? I said, nope, the Chiefs did. And she looked at me, and she had that smile. And before I could say anything, she spits out, don't be surprised if these two have a repeat performance in 2020 when we're in Tampa. And I say the same thing. Don't be surprised if these two go at it again one year from now. I wouldn't be surprised at all. You take a look at the way these two teams are constituted, the way they're built. They have the better part of their course coming back. Very few off-season questions for either one of these teams. So you look at it, they're primed for another repeat performance. Of course, me being up here in New England, <laughs> I hope that one other player is playing maybe right. a game in Tampa. Uh, let's, well, let's make the assumption. You can't make the assumption that that guy's coming back. I, I right. love to believe he will be, but, uh, 
in all in actuality, no, I think you look at these two teams and right now they have to be the favorites in their two conferences simply because of the fact that they're the two hottest teams right now. And like I said, there are very few off season questions for the Chiefs and for the 49ers. So if they can keep that core intact and by all accounts they should, uh, these two teams seem to be on a collision course once again. Let's take a look inside of the rumor mill and I heard something that got my ears peaked and it got my attention peaked. It concerns wide receiver A.J. Green. Of course, now with the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, there's a rumor flying around right now that A.J. Green may change his Bengals stripes for Gold Rush stripes. There's a lot of thing, a lot of people saying right now that the favorite to land A.J. Green resides in the Bay. Can you imagine how dangerous that receiver core will be? If A.J. Green does indeed wind up signing with San Francisco? It will be, and that's a very interesting spot for him. I did hear the same rumors, and I've heard a lot of rumblings about, of course, up here in New England, a lot of people seem to think that he's uh, rumored to the Patriots an awful lot. To tell you the truth, I really don't see that. I don't think A.J. is the type of receiver that would come up here and be able to succeed right off the bat. I think the 49ers offense is tailor-made for him. I think the way that they play and the types of routes that they run in San Francisco makes it a little bit easier for a guy like A.J. Green to come in and assimilate very quickly. To me, I think that's a great spot for him. You pair him right alongside a guy like Debo Samuel, all of a sudden you're taking a look at a guy that can run the backfield, have those jet sweep motions, and then a pure take the top off the uh, the defense receiver in A.J. Green. Even a guy that can drop back and play the slot a little bit. So this could be a very interesting fit for them, especially if you believe the rumors that uh, an Emmanuel Sanders could either – could go either way at this point that you know there's rumors that uh, that he may move on there's rumors that he loves San Francisco and would love to stick around i personally as you know someone that's followed the niners the last few years i think that's a great spot for emmanuel and i think he can help to build that young wide receiver core that they have in uh, in san francisco but aj green would be an interesting uh, fit for them the one thing that you want to be careful of if you're a niners fan or if you're a part of the niners organization is the injury history and the difficulties that he's had staying on the field. If he can figure out a way to, to get that taken care of, then that's definitely one of the more formidable wide receivers in the league, and he can definitely help a team, uh, especially a team like the 49ers. He may even put them over the top. And don't forget, folks, not only did the 49ers draft Debo Samuel, they drafted another receiver you know, out of Baylor in uh, Jalen Hurd, who spent this year on IR. And can you imagine that core, should A.J. Green sign with San Francisco and keep Emmanuel Sanders, and all indications are by this Niner fan and an insider that Emmanuel Sanders will stay in San Francisco. Of course, Debo Samuel, that's three. And then you put a fourth receiver out there in Jalen Hurd. Then, of course, you got to add George Kittle to the mix. You know, you want to talk about some weaponry. Garoppolo, as it stands right now, and we don't know where A.J. Green is going to land, as it stands right now, with Jalen Hurd coming back from injury and the possibility of A.J. Green coming to the Bay, this passing game is going to get another serious upgrade. Amazing. And you think about the running game that San Francisco already employs by putting these guys alongside a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo, being able to utilize those weapons, it only adds another dimension to his game. I thought Jimmy played a serviceable game in the Super Bowl. I think he's getting a lot of undue criticism for the job that he did in the second half. I think a lot of that was breakdowns in communication. I think a lot of it was play calling. These things needed to be shored up. Unfortunately, um, for the 49ers, it just didn't end up working out. And a lot of that has to be credited to the Kansas City defense, too, who I think played their best game of the season. And I think that's why they ended up winning the Super Bowl. But getting back to Green, putting him in a San Francisco uniform does change the dimension. And you mentioned Jalen Hurd. Hurd and Samuel were two guys that I scouted pretty heavily last year in doing my draft prep and analysis going into the 2019 draft. I liked them for the Patriots. I really thought that either one of those players, as a matter of fact, in a couple of different mocks that I did, I mocked uh, Samuel going to the Patriots in one and Hurd going in the other. So these two guys being a part of that, that uh, offense with Jimmy Garoppolo, who, again, studied under the greatest of all time. He studied under Tom Brady. So that type of synergy, if he can find it with that wide receiver core, 
again, that only makes them that much more dangerous in trying to defend that NFC title. And what's going to be even more dangerous for Jimmy Garoppolo, and you said this earlier in the season, in fact, you said it um, before Week 17 when they went to Seattle and won the NFC West, which you and I both correctly predicted, by the way, we still Mm -hmm. don't know the ceiling of Jimmy Garoppolo because he's coming back from an absolutely horrific injury. And except for one game this year, Late in the fourth quarter, and it was against Carolina, Jimmy Garoppolo took every single snap under center. Yeah, he absolutely did. And you learned a lot about Jimmy's durability this year. And I think that, if you're a Niners fan, that really gives you uh, a lot of, uh, I guess the best way to get a lot of um, optimism in terms of what that means for this coming season. To me, that was one of the biggest question marks on Jimmy was, will he be durable enough to make it through an entire season? Unfortunately, and as much as I I like Jimmy an awful lot, that was a question mark that I had. He really hadn't had uh, an opportunity to prove that he could stay healthy. Uh, In the, uh, the, the season where he took over for Tom Brady here in New England for a few games, he did end up missing the last two games because of injury. And a lot of people were wondering if injuries played into the fact that the Patriots chose to move on from Tom Brady and move on from uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and keep Tom Brady at the time. Obviously, that ended up being the decision that was the right one for both teams. But with Jimmy this year showing that he can play a full 16-game season deep into the playoffs, play well into February, That's something that is a very encouraging sign. I think a lot of the growth that you're going to see in Jimmy this year is decision-making, maybe a little bit more poise in the pocket, uh, maybe a little less um, reluctance to throw the football away. I think you're going to see a lot of that. Maybe I'm taking a few more sacks. These are types of things that you see quarterbacks develop as they start to come into their own. Uh, this is going to be a big year for Jim, and I think uh, he's he's up to the challenge. I think he's up to the challenge also. And that 49er defense, you can't give them enough credit, even though it, it just seems like they ran out of gas, you know, in the Super Bowl with Kansas City coming on like they did, and we both talked about them. But this San Francisco team, especially their defense, played way over their heads and out of their minds and got them to Miami. This defense is strong enough to get them to Tampa next year. And with the way this diff unit played, there were many questions going into the season, and you and I posed a lot of them on this program about how they will mesh together. I think we got our answer. We definitely did. And if there's one thing, if you're a Niners fan, that going into, and it's their ability to be able to make plays and shut teams down. For three quarters, they held the most prolific and the most productive quarterback really to look like an average mere mortal at Mm -hmm. times. And that's not an easy thing to do, not the way Mahomes played in this postseason. So when you look at what they can do with the front seven of of, uh, San Francisco, the linebacking core, and the way that the the, uh, the, uh, the secondary uh, has, has shown that they're capable of playing, this is a defense that is set to compete for a good number of years. If I'm the Niners, if I'm looking for any help, it probably would be in the secondary. I'd like to see them maybe beef up the safety position a little bit, get a little more depth uh, at that position. I think that's something that can add a little more pop and a little more strength to their lineup. But that front seven is uh, an absolute monster. The four-man rush that they put on in the Super Bowl was a thing of beauty to watch. It really was. And had the 49ers been able to make a couple of offensive plays, this could have been a different outcome, and we might have been having a parade in San Francisco rather than Kansas City a couple of weeks ago. But um, I wouldn't worry too much about the defense for uh, for the 49ers. I think they're poised uh, to make another run and another deep run in the playoffs in 2020. And uh, every every other uh, team's fan base in the NFC West has uh, has has gotten a hold of me, and they're saying, "Oh, you guys got lucky." This ain't luck, folks. This is a team that grew up right before our eyes. And I go back to the conversation we had before the Super Bowl. In fact, Super Bowl week, someone asked me if you were to pick a game that identified the 49ers season. And I hate saying this to another fan base, which have become friends of mine. If you were to pick a game that identifies the 49ers season and how far over the curve they were, you got to look at that game in New Orleans. Absolutely. I think that really is the game that solidified their claim on the NFC. That's the game that I watched because I had been high on New Orleans pretty much all season long. 
I'll be honest with you. They were New Orleans was my Super Bowl pick preseason in 2019. I right. predicted the New England Patriots, uh, the New Orleans Saints Super Bowl. I thought they were going to face the 49ers in the NFC Championship game, but I believe that the uh, uh, that the New Orleans Saints were going to ride a hot hand in Drew Brees, and in my opinion, a, a pretty good defense uh, to be able to uh, to get to that point. The 49ers being able to win, especially in the fashion that they won in a shootout, knowing that the defense was not going to be able to stop a prolific offense like the, like the Saints, uh, but they could match them point for point. To me, that proved any type of doubt that you had about the 49ers and their ability to score points. That game put that to rest. I looked at the 49ers in a whole new light after that. I had really become a believer all season long because of the the information you had been giving me and, you know, turning me on to this team and what they could do offensively. But this was at another level, and it really showed me that this was a championship-caliber team. And from that point on, I looked at them as such, as they were the team to beat in the NFC, and they proved to be that. And after my first appearance in the preseason on Locked On Patriots, when we talked about if there are any teams that could unseat the Patriots, we briefly talked about if there are any teams that could surprise out of the NFC, and the first team that was in my head was San Francisco. And a lot of people thought I was crazy when I said that in August, you know. But at the same time, as the season went on, 3-0, and 4-0, and 5-0, and eventually 8-0 and before they lost their first game in a gutty, gutty effort against the Seattle Seahawks at Levi's Stadium. And remember, the first time the 49ers and the Seahawks hooked up, the 49ers were really, really beat up. And they were minus George Kittle, who was out for two games with a significant injury. They were minus Kyle Juszczyk, who was out with a significant injury. When the playoffs came around, the 49ers were healthy. That game in Seattle got them the rest they needed. And I think it gave the 49ers a lot of confidence going forward into 2020 that, yes, they can go into Seattle and beat them there just like they did the last Sunday in December. Absolutely. I think a lot of the postseason, most of the postseason, gave them the confidence that they need to propel forward. Look, when you beat teams that – are supposed to beat you. It really is is a uh, it's it's a big feather in your cap. Now, granted, San Francisco 49ers were the top dog. They knew that going into this postseason. However, there were still a lot of doubters. People looked at it, and I don't want to say that you know. And this is not how I feel in the least. But sometimes people will look at you as a paper number one seed or a uh, a de facto number one seed, and someone yep. that you feel well. There are teams out there that are a little bit deeper, that have a little bit more pedigree that have a little bit more experience, that can beat you in the postseason. That means nothing when you take a look at what the, the, these teams are capable of doing in the postseason. The hot teams are the ones that ride the strong play of their strongest unit, and the San Francisco 49ers did that. They rode their running game. They rode their defense all the way to the Super Bowl. Uh, they got some. I, I thought they got pretty decent production out of their passing game in the Super Bowl. I know a lot of people will probably fight me on that. I stand by it. I don't think they played as poorly as a lot of people are making that out to be. What you saw, again, were breakdowns in communication, I think breakdowns in some of the play calling, and just running into a defense in Kansas City that really played into its own at the best possible time. So they did run into a perfect storm in the Super Bowl, but again, the growth that they showed getting to that level uh, to me, it really solidified their uh, their place in uh, in the NFL, and they walked away from that game knowing they could win it. That's a big, big key for a team that wants to build on a strong Super Bowl championship type uh, year that the San Francisco 49ers had. They walked away from that game knowing that it was it could have been theirs. Uh, there's no worse feeling in the world than going to a game like that and coming away and saying we had absolutely no shot. When you know that you're close and you know that you have a shot, it only makes you that much more hungry to get back and to prove to everyone that year one was not a fluke. I believe that's exactly what you're going to see out of the San Francisco 49ers this year. Which brings me to the Kansas City Chiefs, the world champions, their first since Super Bowl four. And the way that they played in the second half of the season and in the second half of the Super Bowl. Hell, let's look at the second half of all three of their playoff wins. Down by 10-plus points, three separate games. 
division round against Houston, AFC title against Tennessee, Super Bowl against San Francisco, and they were able to win all three by double digits. It just shows you the depth of the Kansas City Chiefs. Give them all the credit and all the praise in the world. They definitely earned this world championship. Absolutely. A team that falls down double digits to teams like the Houston Texans, the Tennessee Titans, and the eventual NFC champion, the San Francisco 49ers, you fall down that to that level. It, it's amazing that you're able to come back from one of those games, let alone all three. It also goes to show you how prolific that offense can be once the pilot is lit. And that's exactly what Patrick Mahomes did. He turned it up exactly when he needed to do that. He got very good play from his uh, wide receiver core. Can't say enough about Travis Kelsey and the job that he's done in the postseason. And also Damian Williams, again, in the Super Bowl, I think played a tremendous game. So between those three factors, plus a defense that played a lot better than people gave it credit for all year long. I think the city, uh, the Kansas City defense was vastly underrated all season long. Uh, you talk about the job that Chris Jones did and the t- defensive tackle position. He was a huge uh, force in being able to help contain the San Francisco running game just when the, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs needed him to do that. Frank Clark stepped up very big. Jerron Matthew had a tremendous season and I think was one of the real game changers when it came to the uh, the Kansas City defense this year. But the guy I give a ton of credit to is Steve Spagnuolo. He came in and changed that whole complexity, that whole attitude of Kansas City. He made them an aggressive defense. He made them a defense that was ball hawking. They went after it. They weren't afraid to pin their ears back in after the quarterback. They didn't play it conservatively as they did in 2018. 2019 was all about putting the pedal to the metal and trying to beat teams at their own game. You saw the, the, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs do that. They peaked at the right time, and that's why they were they were uh, uh, Super Bowl champions. And again, hats off to them because they had a tremendous postseason. They absolutely had a tremendous postseason, and this will put a wrap up for us on uh, the 2019 NFL season, and it'll also kick open the door to the NFL season for 2020. Of course, we're going to be covering it all off season. We'll begin with free agency. Who goes where? And there are some very interesting names in free agency. When I have him back next week, I have some quarterback questions, but we'll save that for next week. He is Mike Tabake, the man in charge of Locked On Patriots on uh, full pre- on uh, the Lockdown Podcast Network and one of the men in charge of full press coverage. He joins me every week to talk NFL. Always a good time to have you on, my friend. Always a pleasure to join you, my friend. 2019 was great. I wish it could have been a little bit happier of an ending for you, but if it's any consolation, I think 2020 might be just as bright, if not brighter, on the horizon. But I enjoyed covering the season with you this year. We put a wrap on it. On to 2020, buddy. Can't wait. On to 2020, my friend. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Brian. Have a great day. Speaking of putting a wrap, that'll put a wrap on this one as I thank you for joining me for this edition of the program. I want you all to have a great day. God bless. Remember to make your next move your best move. And always remember, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are not big enough. Dream big, do bigger. I am, and I hope you all are too. Until next time, it's coming out.